Good afternoon, everyone. I call to order the December 2022 meeting of the Finance and Operations Committee of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Thank you to those who are joining us via the live stream video and those attending in our boardroom or via Zoom. Let me welcome our student representatives for today, Sarah Davis and Emily Graysbrink. Am I saying this correctly, Emily? Oh, all right. Well, I don't want to be close. I want to get it right. It's Grassbrink. Grassbrink. All right. Thank you. Both from the Twin Cities campus. Our first item is review and action on four collective bargaining agreements. Vice President Ken Horseman and Senior Director Monty Vang are here to walk us through each. We will take the collective bargaining agreements one at a time and start with the Minnesota Teamsters Public and Law Enforcement Employees Union Local 320. Vice President Horseman and Senior Director Vang, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Mayron and Regents. Today we bring before you, as Chair Mayron stated, four labor agreements for your review and approval. The first agreement is the agreement reached between the Teamsters Public and Law Enforcement Employees Union Local 320 and the University of Minnesota. This agreement covers 1,345 employees engaged in building and grounds, maintenance, mechanics, and food service work across our campuses, research, and outreach locations, and is for three years. <clears throat> the agreement covers the contract period July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2025. It includes an FY23, the 3.85% adjustment to salary, Anyone making less than $20 per hour at that point after that adjustment will be augmented to $20 per hour. There are also 26 job classifications that will receive market adjustments. Employees who are on the top step of their pay scale in FY23 will receive a 5% increase. In FY24, Employees in this unit will receive a 4% general increase or the university's pay plan, which is ever greater. And in that year, new pay scales with a $20 minimum will be implemented and the augments removed with compression adjustments made as necessary to future steps. <clears throat> In FY25, employees in this unit will receive a 4% general increase or the university's pay plan, which is ever greater. This contract also includes an additional paid holiday for the observance of Juneteenth, which in 2023 will likely be Monday, June 20th. Transit passes may also be available in the future for all Twin Cities employees and during the life of this agreement, uh, these employees would have the advantage of that if those are put into place, and summer work opportunities. <clears throat> Negotiations officially began on June 2nd, 2022, and the parties reached a tentative agreement and mediation on October 22nd, 2022. The union completed its contract ratification process on November 3rd of this year. Board approval is required for this collective bargaining agreement to be implemented. We would like to recognize the negotiating team members from Teamsters Local 320 and the University of Minnesota for their diligence and commitment on behalf of our Teamster represented university employees. And with that, I will stop and we ask for your approval of this agreement. Thank you. Before we turn to discussion, is there a motion to recommend approval of the resolution related to the proposed labor agreement with Minnesota Teamsters Public and Law Enforcement Employees Union Local 320? I'll move it, Chair. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? <laughs> there being no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The motion is approved. <clears throat> Next, we turn to AFSCME Council 5, Healthcare and Non-Professional Unit Local 3260, Vice President Horseman and Senior Director Vang, if you would like to present on this item. Thank you, Chair Mayron. <clears throat> there are some uh, contract uh, agreements uh, within all um, 
all three of these uh, agreements that are common. So I'll start there and then go into uh, specifically Unit 3260. So negotiations with AFSCME Council 5 locals, 3937, 3800, 3801, and 3260 began on June 1st of this year. The parties reached tentative agreement on November 7th of 22. The respective locals contract ratification process was completed on November 21st, 2022. And as we said for the Teamsters, board approval is required so that we can implement. Again, I would like to recognize the members of both the university and the AFSCME Council 5 bargaining teams for university technical clerical office support and healthcare employees for their diligence and commitment to reach an agreement on behalf of our university labor represented workers. <clears throat> All these contracts include an additional paid holiday for the observance of Juneteenth, election leave for employees eligible to vote in tribal elections, and transit passes should passes be offered to Twin Cities employees during the life of this agreement. Council 5 Local 3260 does represent the university's healthcare non-professional employees included in Unit 4 at the University of Minnesota as defined by the Minnesota Public Employer Labor Relations Act. Currently, the total number of employees in this local is, one is 191. <clears throat> this is a three-year contract from July 1st of 22 to June 30th of 2025 and includes the 3.85% general adjustment in FY23 and anyone making less than $20 an hour will be augmented to the $20 per hour for this year. In addition, there are five job classification receiving market adjustments. The uniform allowance will now be set at $250 a year and employees will receive step increases. In FY24, this unit will receive a 4% general increase or the university's pay plan, which is ever greater. And new pay scales with a $20 minimum will at that time be implemented with compression adjustments made as necessary. Step increases will become automatic with satisfactory performance reviews and in FY25, employees in this unit will receive a 4% general increase or the university's pay plan, which is ever greater. With that, I will stop and ask for your approval of this agreement. Thank you. Uh, before there is discussion, is there a motion to recommend approval of the resolution related to the proposed labor agreement with AFSCME Council 5 Healthcare and Non-Professional Unit Local 3260? Move it. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on this motion? Yes, uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, just a brief comment and not uh, really looking for an answer, but or at this time, but it's certainly discussion that we can have later. Um, you know, I would appreciate um, our the board's role and, and how we deal with collective bargaining agreements. I've been learning a lot. Kind of, I feel like, well, it's true, still as a newer um, board member. Um, and just trying to understand for the future um, clarity on the board's role moving forward from a knowledge standpoint around some of these um, negotiations with different bargaining units, um, understanding and respecting the sensitivities, guardrails, parameters around labor negotiation. Um, and as the board, you know, continues relationship building, um, trust and mutual respect with our bargaining units, um, you know, with this particular cycle, um, I felt like uh, and this is, of course, nuance and due to a variety of reasons, but, um, you know, that maybe we had um, some more um, knowledge or understanding of what was going on with some of our negotiations, but not others. Um, I am I'm still learning a lot, of course, in this role in general, and I didn't even realize we had three different contracts with AFSCME. And so as someone who really cares about um, labor negotiations, our university's <clears throat> workers being supportive of all of that, just wanted to um, put that this statement on the record um, in, you know, under one of these three AFSCME contracts just to get a better um, understanding and I guess consistency from my um, standpoint of how we're informed on things. Um, again, understanding um, there's different sensitivities and things around labor negotiations, but that's all I have. Thanks, Chair Mayron. All right, thank you very much. Anything further on this motion? There being no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those, those opposed, say no. 
The motion is approved. Next, we turn to Ask Me Council 5 Clerical and Office Support Unit Locals 380 and 3, I'm sorry, 3800 and 3801. Vice President Horseman, Senior Director Vang, back to you on these. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Mayron. Uh, Ask Me Council 5 Locals 3800 and 3801 do represent the university's clerical and office support employees. These uh, employees are included in Unit 6 under the Minnesota PELRA Act. The total number of employees currently is 1,266. Again, it's a three-year contract from <clears throat> July 1st of this year through June 30th of 2025. In FY23, uh, these employees will receive the 3.85% general increase. Uh, those below $20 will then be augmented to $20. In FY24, this unit will receive a 4% general increase or the university's salary plan, which is ever greater, and new pay scales with a $20 minimum will then be implemented with compression adjustments as necessary. FY25, will, uh, uh, this unit will receive a 4% general increase or the university's salary plan, whichever is greater. And with that, uh, Chair Mayron, we ask the board for their approval of this agreement. Thank you. Before we turn to discussion on this item, is there a motion to recommend approval of the resolution related to the proposed labor agreement with AFSCME Council, uh, Council 5 Clerical and Office Support Unit Locals 3800 and 3801? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on this item? <clears throat> there being no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The motion is approved. And our final collective bargaining agreement is with AFSCME Council 5 Technical Unit Locals 3937 and 3801. Vice President Horseman and Senior Director Vang, if you could talk to us about this one. Yeah. AFSCME Council 5 Locals 3937 and 3801 represent the university's technical employees and are included in Unit 7 under the Minnesota PELRA Act at the <clears throat> University of Minnesota. The total number of employees is 637. It is a three-year contract, July 1st of 22 through June 30th of 25. In FY23, there will be a 3.85% general adjustment Anyone making less than $20 an hour after that adjustment will be augmented to 20. There are 10 job classifications that will receive market adjustments. In FY24, this unit will receive a 4% general increase or the university's salary plan, whichever happens to be greater. <clears throat> and new pay scales with a $20 minimum will be implemented with compression adjustments made as necessary. In FY25, employees in this unit will receive a 4% general increase or the university's pay plan, which is ever greater. <clears throat> With that, Chair Mayron and Regents, we ask for your approval of this agreement. Thank you. Before we turn to discussion on this item, is there a motion to recommend <clears throat> approval of the resolution related to the proposed labor agreement with AFSCME Council 5? Clerical and Office Support Unit Locals 3800, I'm sorry, wrong one. 3930, let me start over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there a motion to recommend approval of the resolution related to the proposed labor agreement with AFSCME Council 5 technical unit locals 3937 and 3801? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on this item? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. The motion is approved. Thank you very much. Congratulations on excellent work on both sides. Uh, Regent Powell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a quick question for uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Horseman, and also sort of thanks to both the unions and the um, uh, our uh, administration team for a successful outcome, everything of which was approved unanimously. We're, we're, we're very grateful. Question I have is as we look forward to a discussion we're going to have later this afternoon, can you in round numbers just tell us what the um, totality of the cost will be over three years? Um, 
Well, in uh, starting on page four of the docket uh, for this committee, there are summaries of the uh, incremental cost over base. And I know at this time, uh, Vice President Tonneson is working with our office on what uh, holistically in the budget that impact would be. Uh, but for uh, Teamsters over the three year period, uh, it is approximately uh, a total um, cumulative amount of uh, 9.8 million with 4.4 of that coming in FY23. Uh, for uh, local 3260 of AFSCME, it is approximately uh, between 420,000 and 478,000 annually. It, it varies a little bit, but that's an annual incremental amount year over year. For uh, clerical and office units, uh, uh, 3,800 and 3,801. Uh, the first year is 2.3 million, then 2.9, then 2.5. And then as we get into uh, the technical units, uh, it starts off around 1.5 million, uh, is about that same amount in FY24, and then <clears throat> 1.3 in FY25. And again, these are, this is estimated cost analysis, and uh, it, adjust the base every year for the previous year's increase. Thank you. Regent Swigum, did you have a comment you wanted to make? Madam Chair, thank you. And I'm very similar to uh, Chairman Powell's, but a follow up on that if I, if I could. Uh, and again, Ken, to you and your team, congratulations for uh, successfully getting this. To the unions, congratulations for successfully getting to an answer. I'm sure there were some tough times involved um, maybe some folks walked away from the table, you or them at one time or another, but you came together, you got it done. And to both the unions and, and to you, Ken, and your team, congratulations. Uh, two questions, if I could. Uh, Chairman Powell was uh, going to the costs of the mm -hmm. total four agreements. I'm going to be a little bit more specific. How much over uh, what might be in our current budget that we uh, determined last June, may this be over what uh, President uh, Gable had in her budget because we have to find the money someplace. <clears throat> yes. So I want to find out where we're going to find the money from. Well, there are there are implications to the three year agreement and um, the the incremental increases made year over year. The first year, uh, and again, I'll defer to Vice President Tonneson on the overall budget uh, outlook of this. But we we both sides stuck to the 3.85%. Um, there is the uh, bringing those under 20 up to 20 with an augment temporarily till the next year on top of that. But the, um, the, the uh, job classification adjustments where we took specific jobs and adjusted them to market, that was done after a review of individual departments current budget to see that it could fit into their current budget. So those uh, should be accounted for. Um, um, but I, I will leave it to Vice President Tonneson to uh, go beyond that. But I believe the second two years of the budget are will be part of the planning process. True. Sure. My, my, oh, I was gonna say, my thinking is um, Ms. Tonneson will be presenting a little bit later in this agenda and that perhaps we could explore this with her at that time, the impact that this adoption of these uh, contracts have on the budget, what they had already accounted for before the contracts were entered into, and then what the increase was, the delta after, uh, as a result of those contracts. Would that make sense, Regent Swigum? It, it would, I'll go to my second question then, yes. Chair. And, and again, uh, again, your comfort gives me some comfort, at least in the current budget year that we've already adopted, that. Uh, we're going to be able to find the money someplace. It's got to come from someplace, and I just wanted to have an idea where it might come from. Uh, we have a little more flexibility probably in the out second and third year than, than we do in the first year. Uh, my second question gets to the uh, uh, approval of and the agreement to an additional paid holiday. Um, they're not free, as I found out at the legislature. There's a cost involved in them, either in a cost of lack of production, mostly, performance for that there's a day loss of work or 
I assume since some people have to work, they're probably going to get time and a half or double time on that day. Uh, did you at all in these numbers figure into what the lost cost might be to production and or the overtime pay for that holiday being given? Um, we, uh, I would have to look and bring those figures back to you. I don't have them readily available. Um, we have looked at the commitment to bring Juneteenth forward uh, as a university recommendation in the negotiations for about the last year and a half, two years. It's been, uh, and this was the moment to do it. The Faculty Senate had looked at uh, cancellation of classes and approved that. Um, earlier this year, I believe. And so this was the next step, and we still have to review this with civil service as well because their rules will have to be adjusted. Uh, in regard to what a day of payroll costs at the university, that is uh, approximately about $8 million, I believe. But again, that is a general estimate on my part just based on what I know of our <clears throat> biweekly payroll and looking at those figures regularly. Um, I'm not sure that you would equate that to what the cost of a holiday is. Well, Madam Chair, not much in life comes free, Ken. I understand that, yes. I uh, fully so understand that. Very, very, very honestly, I don't care what the date is as yeah. far as the holiday. I, I don't care what the, what the date is. Those are, the date doesn't make any difference. But the, uh, the cost of it uh, uh, certainly does. Now, $8 million, I, I you know, give or take, it sounds like you're willing to give or take, at the state, it was obviously much greater than that. Yeah. Um, uh, but just so just we understand, it's just not something that comes free. There is a, a, lock of, a loss of productivity at some point or another. All right. Any further discussions on these matters? All right. Thank you very much. Our second item is review of the president's recommended 2023 state capital request. President Gable and Senior Vice President Franz are here to present the recommendation. President Gable, would you like to start us off? Yes, thank you, Chair Mayron, Vice Chair Hipsch, and members of the committee. At our October meeting, you approved the 2022 six-year capital plan, which indicated that an updated 2023 state capital request, including projects and cost estimates, would be presented to you in December. So members of the committee, to this end and before you today is our recommended 2023 state capital request. The request reflects investment system-wide from HEPR to our farm initiative and investments specific to each of our five campuses, including the chemistry undergraduate teaching laboratories on the Twin Cities campus, the academic health sciences facility design at UMD, the multi-ethics resource center in Morris, heating and utility infrastructure improvements in Crookston, and student housing and dining improvements in Rochester. So Madam Chair, Senior Vice President Franz will take over for a deeper dive into these projects and the request more broadly. So at this time, I would respectfully turn it over to him. All right. <clears throat> Senior Vice President Franz, who is appearing by Zoom, uh, do you want to take it from here? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, and thank you, President Gable. <laughs> As the president mentioned at the October board meeting, we said that we would return in December with an updated state capital request. <clears throat> While I hope the state will fully fund our request during the upcoming legislative session, I want to provide context for the, that we considered as we developed our request. Now, since the October board meeting, elections have concluded and the state announced another record budget surplus now totaling $17.6 billion, that's billion with a B. Uh, I remember, and um, Regents Figurum will remember when the 0.6 part of that would have been big news at the state, but the 17.6 billion is a large number. But let's recall that the state has not passed a bonding bill since 2020. And overall, state support for our capital needs is well below what is required. In the last 10 years, the university requested over $1.5 billion from the state of Minnesota for HEPR, Higher Education Asset Preservation and Replacement. HEPR is provided by statute, and the responsibility for funding HEPR is assumed by the state. Of the $1.5 billion in HEPR funds that we requested since 2010, the Minnesota legislature has funded $275 million, or approximately 18%. <clears throat> Legislative funding plus our available fu internal funds fall well short of what it takes to maintain more than 30 million square feet of university infrastructure across the state. 
not to mention the nearly $5 billion of backload deferred renewal projects resulting from unreliable and insufficient funding for the infrastructure and asset preservation in the, in the recent years. Our facilities condition assessment says we should be investing about $8 per square foot to maintain our existing infrastructure. Our current investment is about $2.88 per square foot, including all available resources, clearly far below what it takes to have the very best space for the university's mission of teaching, research, and service in such areas as healthcare, innovation, and agricultural exploration. However, we will approach this next session with optimism and a plan to do everything that we can to persuade the legislature to fully fund the university's request. The university's 2023 state capital request, as the president mentioned, includes four projects that are a repeat from our last year's request, because as you recall, there was no bonding bill last year in the legislature, this, this year, I should say, in 2022. First, the, as you can see from the chart, if we could bring up the, um, the one-page chart um, for the board. First, the $200 million request for HEPR funds remains a top priority for the university. HEPR allows us to preserve and renew the university's existing infrastructure to better serve students, maximize the useful life of our infrastructure, and ensure the health, safety, and well-being of building users. The university allocates HEPR funding system-wide based on four categories. The first is health, safety, and responsibility. The second are building systems. The third includes utility infrastructure, and the fourth involves energy efficiencies. Our second item is the chemistry facility. I will point out that we increased the requested amount on this project as directed by Minnesota Management and Budget using their cost escalation methodology. The project costs have now been increased by approximately $31 million to factor in both the extended schedule resulting from the pause in the design and construction as well as general industry-wide construction inflation. Funding for this project will be used to renovate the 95-year-old Fraser Hall to create a new 117,000-square-foot modern chemistry teaching laboratory serving students from literally every college in the Twin Cities, on the Twin Cities campus. This building will provide 18 active learning laboratories serving high-demand STEM courses with space for lab preparation, academic support, and collaborative learning. State funding for the design of this building was provided in the 2020 bonding bill. The project is ready. We are prepared to begin demolition and construction immediately upon passage of a bonding bill. Third, the farm project requests $60 million in state funding. <clears throat> this is for to acquire land, uh, to design, acquire land, and build a new agricultural research and education complex dedica dedicated to the future of advanced agricultural research in Minnesota, or FARM with two A's as we call it. This integrated hub will support researchers, instructors, and industry partners to study all aspects of agriculture, including smart farming, livestock, soil health, water quality, climate issues, and sustainability of rural economies. With FARM, the university seeks to take a big step to become a global leader, and I, we do mean this, a global leader in advancing food and agricultural research, education, and outreach. We've been actively working on land acquisition for sites assembly in Mauer County uh, near, uh, near Austin, Minnesota, and hope to be able to present to the board the first properties for acquisition at the February or March meeting. As we reported before, the Hormel Foundation has already pledged $60 million to match our efforts on this exciting project. Fourth, the $12 million request for state funding would help fund the design of an approximately 180,000 square foot facility in the Duluth Medical District in downtown Duluth to provide high demand healthcare education and interprofessional training. The facility's teaching, clinical practice, and research spaces will support greater Minnesota workforce needs and partnerships with area colleges and health systems, and it will serve local communities with a focus on health equity. We have started preliminary planning activities, including conducting a, a site options analysis. We are also in regular communication with leaders, officials from Duluth and UMD and our university teams 
and the Twin Cities campus will be involved in a thorough program analysis of this planned facility. There are also two new projects on this list, one each for Crookston and Morris. I recently visited these campuses and saw firsthand their infrastructure needs. The heating plant and utility infrastructure improvements at Crookston, totaling about $5 million, will address aged and deteriorated equipment inside the heating plant, as well as related utility infrastructure throughout the campus. Now, the Crookston heating plant was built in, eight, in, 19, I'm sorry, in 1911, even before I was born, and serves the entire campus. This pro I hope I got a few laughs on that. Uh, this project... <laughs> This project is similar to HEPA projects in that the goal is to invest in critical infrastructure to help avoid mechanical failures that could cause major issues and disruptions. The second new project is for the improvements for the multi-ethnic resource center on the Morris campus, again, totaling about $5 million. The multi-ethnic resource center was constructed in 1899. The building lacks an elevator and other basic accessibility infrastructure, as well as up-to-date life, safety, and building systems. This funding would fix those most critical needs in that building, which serves that campus so well. Finally, I'd like to say a word about the University of Minnesota Rochester. As the president mentioned, the UMR facilities uh, are also included in terms of our investment because we want the legislature to understand the system-wide nature of our investment in capital funding. The UMR facilities are not owned by the university, and thus these facilities are not eligible for state general obligation bond funding. You may recall that in June, the board authorized a university-funded uh, investment at UMR for student housing and dining. Since then, we've developed the housing program, the facility renovation plan, and lease terms. Uh, Chancellor uh, Carroll has led a, a really dynamic team in making sure that we and move this project forward and keep it on schedule. You will find that we have an amendment to the lease for the dining program and the contract for dining services in today's consent agenda. As I mentioned at the top of this, we will actively advocate for the university's system-wide state request with the legislature during the 2023 legislative session, assuming the board approves this request at the February board meeting. It's up for review today. We expect final de decisions on what the state will support will come at the end of the session, legislative session, next May. And that concludes my remarks on the capital request, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senior Vice President Franz. Any discussion on the request? Uh, Regent Verhalen. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, Senior Vice President Franz, you know, you started your comments uh, highlighting the large budget surplus that our state has. And I guess I'm gonna ask the question, completely not knowing what your answer is, but should we be asking for more than 200 million, given how far behind we are in keeping up buildings, um, knowing that there's a lot of catch up, knowing that it couldn't all be done in one year, uh, but it could be a multi-year plan. So with that, uh, Chair Mayron, if you would allow Senior Vice President Franz to answer the question or tell me he won't, because that's the <laughs> response I'm getting today. <laughs> I would appreciate it. All right, Senior Vice President Franz, why not more? <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair and uh, uh, Regent Verhalen, well, I, I, I've never been afraid to ask for lots of money, but uh, I think one of the con concerns that we've had is that, um, and uh, I was just listening to the governor this morning on the radio, there, as you know, there are a lot of demands, uh, and there are a lot of legitimate demands. Part of what's going on with the state, as we know, is that a large portion of the $17.6 billion uh, does constitute what we, what we commonly call one-time money, in the sense that we're not sure if this will co continue to recur in the future. So they've been looking out about three different budget cycles, which is about six years, and they, at this point, uh, Man Minnesota Management Budget does, they do see recurring budget surpluses throughout that time horizon. And in addition, uh, but they don't see it at this level. They, they, they believe that some of this uh, uh, 17.6 billion is really, uh, will not always be around. And so the governor this morning made some comments about the need to think big and to invest in our future today. We don't get these kind of opportunities very often. And it's critical that we as a state and we as a university take advantage of those. 
Uh, I think one of the reasons we felt that the uh, modest proposal, if it's modest, but uh, was one that we felt this was clearly something that the, these projects have been around for a while, uh, clearly need, need to be addressed. Uh, and we felt in competing with a lot of other uh, causes that would be coming before the legislature, this would be, um, would be viewed very positively. But it doesn't preclude us uh, as the session goes on from, um, from you know, increasing our uh, request for different kinds of projects. We actually are, are contemplating other, other issues that may flow up in, in individually in other areas that could affect the university. But right now, we felt this was the, the smartest uh, request to make at this time. But, uh, you know, I fully acknowledge it. It's, uh, it could be more, but we think this is the right one to ask right now. Any follow-up? No, thank you. <laughs> All right. Any other comments or discussion on this item? All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will now move on to the third item, which is an update on the MPAC 2025 Capital Financing Program and work on the university's strategic property review. President Gable, Senior Vice President Franz, and Associate Vice President Volna will provide the update. President Gable, if you could please proceed. Yes, thank you, Chair Mayron and Vice Chair Hipsch and members of the committee. So as a reminder, as part of MPAC 2025, action item 5.3, we undertook a review designed to advance innovative financing to support long-term strategic objectives. So that review and the subsequent innovative capital financing plan was completed in late 2021. The plan aimed to enhance the capital financing program at the university, including to leverage the university's ability to issue and manage debt. Our current outstanding credit worthiness and our excellence at managing cash and investments via the endowment. So as part of this plan, we discussed with you at the December 2021 Finance and Ops Committee meeting, our interest in pursuing bonds for which the proceeds would be used only for capital projects within our capital financing program. At the follow-up meeting in February 2022, the board approved the sale of 500 million of university bonds and in April, the bonds were sold and the results of the sale were then shared at the May meeting. In September, the board approved a resolution directing the president to establish a strategic property planning work group. And we look forward to that work group giving us an update to this committee in June of 2023. But for our purposes today, you'll hear an update on the impact 2025 capital financing program and strategic property planning. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Vice President Franz and to Mike Volna to continue the presentation. All right, Senior Vice President Franz. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, and thank you, President Gable. Uh, I also want to express our appreciation to the board for supporting and approving our innovative capital financing plan. I, we believe that the university has positioned itself financially in a very prudent and forward-looking manner. With our new capital financing in place, we must now focus on the implementation of that plan and our proposed next steps. That is why the board's direction for a strategic property planning workgroup was so timely, and it is that workgroup effort that I also want to present today to this committee as an update. We will provide a full report, as the president mentioned, in June, but given the timing of some of our capital plans, we will be before this committee as required throughout this coming year. I know almost always that we, I say we face unprecedented challenges for resource to support our infrastructure, but that statement unfortunately continues to be true. Uh, our capital resource challenges are not unique to the university. They're not even unique to higher education as we know about the state of infrastructure around the country. This past year, the Board of Regents took a bold step on our Impact 2025 strategy by considering and approving the innovative financing mechanisms to help address our biggest hurdles in transforming our campuses. Now, the new capital financing plan that uh, Associate Vice President Volner will walk through in just a moment out allows the university to use these proceeds from the sale of the $500 million in bonds to finance capital projects. Now, today, we are pleased to present plans for how we intend to accelerate some of these capital projects that have strong ties to impact 2025 and will lead to important outcomes for the university. And with that, Madam Chair, I'll ask Associate Vice President Volna to walk you through the details of the update. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Associate Vice President Volna, if you'd like to proceed, please. Thank you very much, Chair Mayron, members of the board. Um, as has been um, articulated for you, um, 
prior previously. Um, our debt management program has historically been a very good program. Um, our rating agencies and our partners around the state and the country recognize we have a great program. Um, having said that, um, over the last few years, we have looked at opportunities to enhance our capital financing program using some techniques and program uh, structures that other highly rated schools have used, like the University of Michigan, Ohio State University, uh, University of um, University of Virginia and Washington University in St. Louis, all highly rated uh, institutions. So as was said, we came to you last year, we reviewed the program and we are delighted that you approved that. For those of you that either don't recall or maybe weren't here, there were three key elements to the program. One was in the uh, use of interest only bonds, which represents the source of funds for our creation of this program. The second element is the internal bank, which is a mechanism for us to internally allocate the funds, collect them back, and then reloan them in the future for additional projects to recirculate those funds. And the third element was the principal repayment reserve, which is the mechanism used to set aside a certain amount, which will grow and become the source of repaying those bonds in the future. Um, all of those have been implemented up to this point, and we're ready to start talking about what we want to use them for. While we're waiting to talk to you about what we want to use those funds for, uh, the proceeds are sitting invested in a very smart strategy uh, so that they are helping to offset the interest expense while we're waiting to use those funds. Um, the principal payment reserve, I'll just briefly touch on that. Uh, you authorized the set aside of $8 million dollars uh, to sit in the endowment and grow as a way for us to pay those bonds off in the future. Um, the governance over those funds, how they're used and such, is governed by board policy. You recall we uh, brought additional policy requirements to you and you approved those in July. So all of that has been set in place. Um, it's important to note that when we originally started on this conversation, we anticipated 100 year bonds and the set aside was intended to grow for 100 years. Because we did not issue 100-year bonds, our anticipation and expectation is those funds will remain growing for 100 years, and we will simply roll the bonds when they become due in 30 years, 60 years, and 90 years, so that we allow those funds to grow and match the amount needed eventually to pay them off. So, as we've been thinking about how we want to use them, I wanted to touch a little bit on, on the status of that. Um, after we issued the bonds and paid off the costs of issuance, we were left with $497.88 million. Um, as I said, those funds have been invested and are waiting to be used. Um, we have been thinking about what to use them on. Um, Currently, our thinking on what we would want to use them for uh, is listed here on this table. About $246.9 million we anticipate using for projects that the board has previously approved and have been in the pipeline, so to speak. Um, additionally, we anticipate needing about $55.6 million to fund our portion of, this, of the uh, state capital request, which you just saw. That leaves us with about $195.3 million to invest in strategic capital properties and projects going forward. I want to make sure that I'm clear when I, when I talk about this and, and that you understand we have not used these funds for this. We cannot use them. You have to approve the use of them. We anticipate coming forward over the next two or three years to seek approval for you to allocate the funds to those projects, but that is our current thinking, that we already have funds and our projects in the pipeline that we must fund, and this is the source of funds, okay? In case you're wondering kind of what we're thinking about and what projects we're talking about, um, we, we started the conversation understanding that the six-year capital plan and the annual capital budget, which are both required by board policy, provide the the framework and the guidance to us for how we would want to allocate these funds. They help us prioritize our capital needs. But in addition to that, we wanted to also think about some additional priorities, such as um, are there projects that we can accelerate and move faster given that we have these, these funds available? 
Are there projects that, if we could do them, would um, free up a log jam that we've had, or that would be uh, the first domino and would sort of catalyze a whole series of additional projects? And so as we've thought about that, um, we're landing on some very important key projects, such as some of these you see here, the microbial cell production facility on the St. Paul campus, the farm project, um, the Morrill Hall project, uh, and so on. Some of these um, you know about and others we will be coming to talk to you about um, in the future. But again, just to reiterate, we, will, we have not spent money on this. this. These are the projects that we are planning on and thinking on and we will be coming forward to seek approval from you as we formulate those plans. Um, it's, as you think about capital financing and, and strategy, you, you really can't divorce your capital needs and your capital financing from your, the property you own. And so as was noted, uh, you authorized in September a resolution to um, charge the administration with creating a strategic property planning work group. That group has been formed and we have been meeting. Um, you, we started our, our review and discussion with the list that we reviewed with you back in July of the strategic properties that potentially could be things we would want to evaluate. That has been the beginning of our discussions and the beginning of our evaluation. Um, in addition, um, the board also authorized uh, the creation of an East Cliff Advisory Task Force. And tomorrow, I believe Regent Davenport will be updating you on the work of that task force. Uh, as it relates to the Strategic Property Planning Group, um, we intend to come back in July of 2023 and give you a much more full and complete report on what the planning committee has done and what our priorities will be recommending to you at that time. So um, our next steps then, um, we, want to finance, we want to finalize our capital investment plan for the remaining bonds, which includes developing the plans and the lists. Um, we obviously have a lot of consultation to do within the institution as well as discussions with you going forward. Um, as we identify the projects that will need funding, we will come forward and seek board approval for those projects and for the allocation of funds for those, for those projects. Um, and as I said, the Strategic Property Planning Work Group will update the, the Finance and Operations Committee more completely in June of 2023. And that, Madam Chair, ends um, our conversation around this. Thank you. Any discussion or questions? Yes. Regent. Uh, just a quick one, uh, yes. Chairman. Thank you. And so the strategic property um, planning resolution, I just want to make sure I'm thinking correctly about this. I mean, the outcome of those conversations that I know are in process now, I mean, actually, it, and we end up with a determination of property that, in fact, may not be strategic, right? And, and therefore, we would, you know, look at uh, some sort of disposition. But it's it, that's really the the outcome is sort of what is and what isn't strategic. Chair Mayron, uh, Regent Powell, I think our intent is that the, the planning work group will be an ongoing entity and will sort of continually evaluate um, properties for strategy. It can work both ways. It can be evaluating strategic properties that we think we need to acquire or it can be evaluating properties that we think no longer have strategic value and we can redeploy those proceeds to a higher value purposes. And a good example of that is what we're currently doing at Rosemont with you more park. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, discussion? All right, thank you very much. I appreciate the presentation on this. Um, at this time, we will move to our next item, which is on compensation and data metrics. Uh, this will be a discussion of current metrics that are used to determine compensation for those positions requiring board approval. Vice President Horseman and Mary Roman Poole, Senior Director, Human Resources, are here to lead the discussion. Vice President Horseman, would you like to start us off on this item? <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Mayron and Regents. We appreciate the opportunity to have an important conversation on the position market and compensation items that you as regents should consider in your review of senior leader agreements 
prior to a vote. We anticipate our time today be spent more in conversation with you than presentation, but to set the stage for this conversation, we are briefly going to step through the policy in an admittedly prescriptive way and the principles that guide us in the criteria we set and use to evaluate a senior leader employment offer. Uh, so, Um, thanks, Mary. The Board of Regents policy employee compensation and recognition outlines the following, um, that there are four principles that should guide the university's compensation and recognition systems. And we are sharing the exact language here for your review. Uh, this policy states that as a university, we strive to achieve and maintain a compensation structure that when combined with benefits and other rewards is competitive relative to institutional peers and other appropriate labor markets and serves to attract and retain a high performance workforce. Next slide. The university also seeks to reward meritorious performance and employee contribution to the success of the university through its compensation and other forms of recognition. And in setting of the initial salaries and pay adjustments that may come subsequently, the university considers the work responsibilities, the market, internal equity with those who may be in <laughs> similar positions, experience and expertise, performance, and other appropriate criteria. We also adhere to compensation and recognition practices that are fair and equitable in design, application, and delivery. The principles stated here translate into criteria that we as the university can use to establish and adjust total compensation packages for senior leaders and are reviewed by the board when assessing the reasonableness of any proposed employment agreement. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Senior Director Roman Kuhl to dig deeper into some of the criteria that we use and how they are being developed. So the first criteria or consideration when reviewing a senior leader agreement is the appropriate market comparison for the specific senior leader role. The market in which the university competes for talented senior leaders varies by campus, but it includes national higher education institutions of comparable size and comparable scope. Now the university has historically compared the base salaries and total compensation of its senior leaders to that paid by the campus location's peer institutions. However, each campus's peer institution number or its end size is, is very, very small. For example, Crookston and Duluth have 11 peer institutions um, each. Morris has 15, Rochester nine, and the Twin Cities 34. Therefore, that peer institution set does not represent the full market for senior leader employment opportunities. In addition, the small comparison group makes published salary survey data unreportable in many instances. So as a result, uh, the university has transitioned to benchmarking each campus location senior leader salaries and total compensation against the full set of institutions included in that location's Carnegie classification. The end size for each campus by making that change now grows to 308 for Crookston, 325 for Duluth, 225 for Morris, 243 for Rochester, and 146 for the Twin Cities. Um, it is important to note that not all of those institutions will uh, supply data to our two preferred higher education surveys from Coupa HR, but there should be an adequate um, participation rate to at least allow the results to be published in most cases. Uh, the university then pulls uh, salary data by Carnegie classification from the Coupa HR administrators in higher education salary survey and the Coupa HR executive comp and benefits in higher education survey. These surveys were selected based on best practice survey methodology and they are actually recommended as the primary factor in the board's assessment of the market. So senior leader base salary and total compensation data is reported for the 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90th percentile in the market. So the second factor that the board would want to consider 
is the experience, expertise, and the expected performance of the senior leader. A particular candidate's credentials may easily warrant a salary that exceeds that 50th percentile or falls short of the 50th percentile. The third variable when assessing the reasonableness of an employment contract are the other aspects of total compensation that are being offered in addition to that base salary. The elements featured in some of our university employment agreements include the University of Minnesota 415M retirement plan, housing allowances, incentives, and relocation assistance. The University of Minnesota 415M retirement plan is used in very limited situations to provide senior leaders with higher income with retirement benefits above the internal revenue section 415 limit. Housing allowance or the use of a residence are currently provided only to the top position of each college uh, location. So that would be our president and our chancellors. The amount or residence provided for the <coughs> president should be consistent with what's being provided at other Big Ten institutions and the amount provided to chancellors would be competitive with the housing allowance being provided by like um, chancellors of other Carnegie classifications. A formal incentive plan is currently provided only to the president and certain roles within athletics. The board would just want to ensure that any incentive amounts provided when combined with base salary fall within the COOPA total cash compensation percentiles. Relocation allowances are provided to senior leader job candidates who need to relocate and per our current policy, these allowances are provided as a lump sum that's equal to one month's salary. Finally, the fourth consideration in the assessment of an employment contract for a senior leader should be the market percentile being paid to other internal senior leaders that have portfolios of similar scope and complexity. It's important to note that the market will be different for each of those senior leader positions. So we would recommend that you assess the market percentiles being paid across those senior leaders rather than comparing actual base salaries. When inconsistencies are found, either the candidate's salary or the salary of the current internal incumbent or incumbents can be adjusted to ensure equitable market percentiles. Again, though, that would be, uh, want to do that based on performance. So going forward, we would recommend the following variables be summarized for the board for all future senior leader agreements and perhaps this means an adjustment to the current personnel appointment summary and I believe you have an example of that in your docket uh, this time. The first set of factors are related to the open position and the labor market. These include an overview of the position, a description of the market that was selected for the salary and total compensation comparisons so the rationale is clear. The salary surveys that were utilized, which can be different depending on position and expertise, and the 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90th percentile for both salary and total compensation. The second set of factors to include in future summaries to the board are related to the job candidate and proposed offer. These include, of course, the candidate's uh, name, the recommended salary offer, their experience, expertise, and anticipated performance that justifies the salary being offered. A section that outlines whether or not incentives, deferred comp, or the supplemental retirement plan, uh, which is the 415M, housing, relocation, or other total comp elements that are being offered, and the salary percentiles for other internal senior leaders that have roles of comparable scope. We can uh, revise this list of criteria, and today we certainly can take your thoughts and recommendations in and adjust uh, our proposal here for the future uh, as warranted. So uh, Chair Mayron and Regents, this ends our brief summary and presentation, and we are ready for your conversation and questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll open this up for discussion. I really want to encourage uh, members around the horseshoe here to react to what it is uh, that 
is being proposed uh, because we need to make sure that they have our input in terms of what we consider important information for us to have as we look at different employment agreements by senior leaders. So, uh, you know, we're talking right now, the number one item it talk, in terms of compensation focuses on the market and they've laid out which market they look, like, look at. Is that appropriate, is that not? If we're gonna push back on it, then we need to have a discussion about that. And now to me is the time when we're not considering a particular employment agreement, but allows us to talk in a more theoretical fashion as to what factors are important to us or less important to us. So I hope people will respond and uh, give your best thoughts to our presenters uh, so that we can, they can take it from here and make sure that they're providing us the kind of information that we find useful to make decisions about uh, senior uh, employee agreements. And with that, uh, we'll start first with uh, my vice chair, uh, Regent Gipsch. Uh, thank you, Chair, chair Mayor, on a great presentation. And uh, I, I always put these comments through my own lens, and my own lens is my own businesses. And uh, I'm just wondering how many applicants I would get if I was paying on the 10th percentile. And is that where I want to be as a, as a business owner, or even the 50th percentile when we have a shortage of workers by what we have? So I think that, uh, that markets are really important, and I think if we're going to be a class act institution and top of our peers, we're going to have to, we, I don't think you can be a top institution if you're not paying uh, good wages. So I just want to leave it there, and I, I like the presentation, and uh, I think we really need to examine ourselves and our top leaders on what we're paying, so. And I don't think everybody will probably agree with me on that, but I just look at it from my own lens and my own uh, businesses, so. And, and let me just uh, play that out a little more. A lot of times we talk about that our goal is to pay at the 50th percentile um, when we're talking about different employment agreements. And I think one of the ways to, uh, things that uh, to me are um, maybe, uh, uh, opposing forces here. On the one hand, we want to be around the 50th percentile. Um, and we talk about that with tuition or we talk about it with housing or whatever. And on the other hand, we say we want to be in the top 10. And so, or we want to be the very best, which would suggest if we want to be the very best, then shouldn't we be paying absolute top dollar, close to 100% of where this is. Um, I know that's not going to happen, but I think that we, we send different messages by way of what we expect out of our leaders um, in terms of um, incentivizing them to have us be our very best, but at the same time have a compensation philosophy that says, uh, let's focus on the midpoint. So picking up on what Regent Hipsch was saying. Any, do you want to comment on either his question or my comments, or should we continue around the horseshoe here? Well, um, I, I'm going to let uh, Senior Director Roman Cool comment in a minute, but what I would say is the idea that the 50th percentile is the goal. Um, in a perfect world, that is true. Um, <coughs> the, the nature of the position, the leadership position, how critical it is, uh, how difficult it is to fill the market. Um, you know, retention is a factor. I think everyone would agree when you lose someone you want to retain, it's going to be much more expensive to refill that position. So I think there's different strategies depending on, you know, the position we're looking at sometimes. With that, I'll turn it over to the actual expert here to <laughs> opine on it. Thank you, Ken. Um, Chair Mayron, I would agree completely with um, what President uh, Vice President Horstman said, and I would just simply add, that is that second criteria. So when you pick that 50th percentile, companies will talk about that being the market competitive number because you want to kind of tag into something, you want to anchor to something, and that's, that's your 50th percentile. But then you get that performance of the individual, that experience, that expertise. Um, maybe they're coming, like um, Vice President Horstman said, into a mission critical role. But you look at that experience that that person brings, and that's where you get into what's competitive for each person, because each person um, does actually command a different market number. So the job has a 50th percentile as its number, but the person commands their own number that they are, 
that we should be targeting. So in some cases, you may be in a situation where you have someone who's highly um, credentialed and has a great deal of experience, and you'd want to bring them in. You know, the market for that person is probably not going to be the 50th percentile. It's going to be something greater. And then the converse is true, too. There could be an individual where the market for that person could be the, the 40th. So you have to look at what's competitive and get a little bit more subjective in that moment. But the, uh, the 50th percentile for the job is quite an objective number. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and thanks for teeing up the conversation. I don't really think I'm going to have anything super brilliant to say, but I do have a question. Um, so it's, it's, I, I believe we've had a presentation or a conversation about this before, and I think it's helpful as a board to have a conversation about having a framework to look through, look at these things through. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, later today we'll have some real-life examples of that, and athletics is kind of a different spin on the conversation. But President Gable, I actually have a question for you around the Carnegie classifications, because I think I read somewhere that you were going to be serving on some work group uh, related to the updating of the Carnegie classifications, which is exciting to have someone from our institution kind of in at the ground level of that work. And so um, this was going to be a general question, but I figured you might be best to explain it. And if not, certainly feel free to pass it along. But just trying to get a little bit of an understand, uh, more a better understanding on the Carnegie classifications. And then um, perhaps, and I know this is probably too early on of a question to ask him because I think I read it was going to be a 12 to 18 month process in terms of these updates, um, how some of that updating might impact um, some of these conversations in this lens. Uh, because um, really just looking for a, a, a more increased understanding of what those are. Because unless I um, haven't been reading this carefully, which could be true, um, I um, only remember usually seeing the Coupa data on these types of things. And I guess I'm just not as familiar with the Carnegie classification. So I just thought I'd um, ask to get some more clarity and then also understanding you have this unique lens now with this upcoming experience. Uh, Chair Mayron, Regent Farnsworth. So the Carnegie classifications um, emerged from the Carnegie Foundation, which we're all familiar with, if, if not in substance, certainly in name, that uh, cover a variety of attributes of different higher education institutions. The relevant one for HR purposes is the um, Carnegie classifications around research. So when people refer to the Carnegie classifications in this context, they're referring to what we often substitute as R1, R2, or, and it goes from there. The Twin Cities is R1, our other campuses all have their own Carnegie classification. There are other Carnegie classifications, um, most notably around community engagement, and we have in our strategic plan that each of our campuses would, re would receive the Carnegie classification for community engagement, but that is not considered a peer-to-peer objective criteria, the peer-to-peer -peer component of the Carnegie classifications that we all use in, in our, when we're hiring, when we're targeting a potential faculty member, uh, and for HR purposes, is the research Carnegie classification, R1 and on down from there. The work that's happening around Carnegie classifications is happening because the entity overseeing the Carnegie classifications shifted to ACE. And in the moment of that change is a good time to call the question on whether they need a new refresh. And there is a small representative committee of all different kinds of higher ed institutions. And I have the honor of representing large research institutions in that group. It is a distinct honor. Um, it is unlikely, although I, I don't know for sure, because we haven't undertaken the process to affect what we've just heard presented, because the research classifications are um, they have a lot of legacy. They may be updated, but they're unlikely to be fundamentally changed. It is more likely that what you would see come out of that work is other types of classifications added to the existing ones. Got it. Thank you. That's helpful, and it gave a little bit of an opportunity to learn more about this upcoming work, too. Um, so uh, I appreciate that, and um, thanks, Chair Mayor, and I'll yield back. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this in the setting, as you mentioned, because usually I make my points when we're looking someone right in the eye as we're talking about their contract, and that's never pleasant and uh, very difficult. Um, I guess it's just one of the hazards of the, of the task. But um, um, 
this I think is I think is really helpful. Um, to some extent, well, the comments that were made earlier, I, I, I did not write my comments in response to what you were saying. I actually uh, was was uh, um, jotting them down before you spoke. But uh, it's a bit like stepping out of the time machine and trying to be a little bit of the public's conscience as we address this. And I would also talk to our uh, address to our student representatives to, to understand that this conversation has a huge impact on you uh, because uh, the effect, the financial effect of seeking a, um, a degree um, has changed dramatically over past decades. So Regent Sviggum, earlier today you talked about uh, how if you pick your year, you can affect the result of your analysis. And I would, I would suggest that when you pick your labor market, um, you are going to ultimately get to a certain result. And I don't look at the university or public universities across the country. I, I think one of the challenges that we have in the last several decades, we've gone from comparing it to public service and public service in other uh, public enterprises, whether it's state government, federal government, military, law enforcement, um, even K, you know, E12 education, K12 education. Um, that makes a big difference. And I think that is the, the appropriate market. The federal government has a GS system that applies across an incredibly wide range of, of jobs and specialties um, and, and somehow has managed to be very effective, much as the university did for the first 150 years of our existence. For that first century and a half, we excelled uh, as, a, as a public university, as a R1 university, and we had great public support and we had salaries comparable to other public uh, specialists at, the, at that point in time. Our, our president was, when I left the board in 95, was paid at 170, which is about 335 today after adjustment for inflation. Um, but the explosion in the late 90s and in the 2000s is based on the very methodology that we're talking about right now. And, and again, I, I understand I'm not necessarily everybody's best pal in saying this, but this analysis to me watching it over these, these last 25, 27 years, is that as long as everybody else is doing it, it's okay that we do it too, even though it has these detrimental effects on, on public dollars and tuition dollars. In fact, if we want to be better than everyone else, and this is what was made, the point was made a little bit earlier, well, you know, we're better than the other schools, so we should be paying even more, which puts even more pressure on our own state and our own students to come up with the funds to cover these these incredible these costs. Now, I also think it's you know it's interesting because as we've gone through the bargaining unit conversations, we don't apply the bargaining unit app, uh, analysis across other higher ed institutions as somehow separate from the rest of the world. There, it's part of the local community, and, and they are compared to other uh, folks in, in public service as well. And I, I tip my hat to them, but um, I, I just notice that it's a different analysis when we do it that way. Now, I don't I don't begrudge people making a lot of money um, if a person. If they build a better mousetrap, they should get the benefit of that. But when it's public institutions and they are paying with state dollars and they're paying with tuition dollars, um, you know, our, the, the public that pays the taxes that ultimately end up covering the costs we're talking about here, the average person makes $51,000 a year. And for a long time, public service generally was comparable or even below the average private sector compensation, but now things have gotten considerably uh, out of alignment. And we have students graduating with a lot of debt. We have students that are not graduating with a lot of debt. Um, and I, I think that, I, I personally think that we've been in a crisis mode for quite some time. We just came out of a presentation about how the public feels about higher education, research universities. And even though they have general positive feelings about the research that we do, they don't like the cost. And this drives the cost. So, the more than tripling of our administrative costs over that period that I've just described um, causes that cost prohibitiveness and it causes a decline in that public perception. So to the other members of this board, you're gonna make a lot of decisions about a lot of contracts during your time on this board. And I would just simply say that whatever rationale you use to support those ever increasing costs, you will then be part of a national problem that is going to be very difficult for young people in this country to address as they try to improve themselves and improve their communities. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, Regent Powell. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Mayor Ron. And just um, 
maybe I'll maybe just to begin, uh, just a nod to uh, Regent Rocha's points, some of which I disagree with, but certainly you know the commentary on administrative cost and the importance of you know doing everything we can to uh, control that. I think is for, resonates very strongly you know with me and. I, um, I, I know that this is something that uh, the president and her team are working on, and I think in very substantive uh, and, and good ways. And, and so that is going to be a critical part of keeping all of this together. Regent Powell, can you pull your microphone closer oh, to sorry. you? Thank you very much. Yeah. Yep. And so, so then I, I'll just go on to say um, uh, I really, I, I'm very supportive of, of, of market-based compensation, uh, even recognizing uh, 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 many of the points that uh, Regent Roche has made. I, I mean, the alternative, I think, is some kind of, you know, wage and, uh, you know, price control, which I, I just think is unlikely, uh, you know. And so we, it, this is, in fact, uh, a, a huge industry, you know, for the country. Higher ed is hundreds of billions with hundreds of thousands of employees, and the markets are very deep uh, and very, you know, sort of lots of data. And so I think... There's just a reality uh, of, um, you know, of, of, of uh, market um, uh, based market based compensation, and that's really how how it works. The the, the and so I'm supportive of this approach. Um, I, one um, aspect of it that I think it would be helpful to um, keep us remind you know remind us of from time to time is my understanding is that mobility. You know, within this this the market, if if you will, in higher ed, mobility is quite high, and um, so there is actually quite a bit of turnover. Most of it is voluntary, which means someone moving from one place to another place or something mm -hmm. better, and some, of course, you know, inv involuntary where people are counseled out. But I think it is important to remind us that we are in a pretty dynamic market with with a lot of my mobility, so that there is. I think that brings home the re reality of this. And specifically, you know, one of the things that, that I worry about is, uh, is sort of within our model, I, I worry about the, the, the poaching and the targeting of, you know, very high potential, very high talented leaders, you know, that I know is happening increasingly at this institution, the loss of people who really were counting on to, you know, to, you know, for our future success. And do we have the flexibility within, you know, how we think about compensation to do what we need to do to retain those people? Now, okay, everybody has their limit, but I do, I do, I am concerned about poaching of talent. We've heard it uh, at a couple different meetings with our faculty representatives. And I just wonder, you can comment a little bit about mobility, um, how we handle poaching, um, which is sort of maybe a, a lesser point than the core point you're making about market base, but still I think important to us as we think about retaining you know, our key leaders. Um, Chair Mayron, uh, Regent Powell, uh, that is uh, a present challenge that um, affects our faculty and affects our administrative leadership teams. Um, uh, if you look at our peers, uh, and I think we have had these informal conversations uh, with, with leaders at the university, many of us have seen at peer institutions, colleagues that we are connected with uh, move on. And especially during the last three or four years, there's been a lot of change. And that continues, I think, uh, uh, a credit to uh, President Gable and her management is that as we look around, uh, many of us, even on a short time in our role of several years, uh, find ourselves one of the more uh, retained longer term people in the Big Ten, for instance. I do know that at the university, and it is by department because uh, they have to look at their budgets, that when a critical faculty member or uh, administrator uh, is being uh, sought after, that there is a point in time where you look at, is it possible to make a retention offer? What is, what is, the, what is the risk if they do leave? What programs, what research uh, gets sidelined or have a challenge? And, uh, you know, what, uh, what is the cost to retain them? And often, as you know, 
uh, from our past environments, sometimes when you do retain someone who is considering an outside offer, that probably won't be the last time that happens with that individual. So there does come a point in time where maybe you don't make that retention decision. Uh, I'm gonna see if uh, Senior Director Roman Cool has any other thoughts. My only other thought would just be that um, I think there is more of a tendency for people to be able to move more easily across the country because of remote work options. And um, we do find, and like this or not, the more mobile the workforce is, the more it does tend to fuel um, this movement of salaries. So um, unfortunately, that begets more of a problem. Uh, you will oftentimes hear people say that um, when you go out to hire somebody is when you realize how much things have moved and what you have to do and what you have to pay to get them to come in the door. And when you do that, that sometimes creates um, equity issues with people who have been real loyal and have stayed that whole time. You want to repair those situations too. So part of our problem is probably due to that mobility that we're seeing, and we are seeing that, yeah. Okay, good. I mean, I'm not looking for kind of the answer, but I just, it is a, con it is a concern of mine, and I appreciate you know, your commentary on it. Thank you. Uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Marion. Um, the conversation's had a couple different twists since I put my name on there, and I have so much I'd like to contribute, <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> I, we want your thoughts. We want your thoughts, We're please. Um, first, let me say that I support this approach. Um, I, I do especially like the varied percentile base for taking a look at salaries. I've used that in in my experience as a final decision maker, and we're using it here in a group approach um, as we appoint these. And I, I think it, it gives some consistency, some commonality in how we look at the different criteria. And I think, um, especially with the competitive nature that we're in, um, is is an essential piece of this. And I the competitive nature, I think we have to recognize there's a crisis in higher ed leadership. Good leaders in higher education at whatever level you're looking at, effective leaders are hard to come by. There's growth, there's, there's the, the mass resignation, all those kind of things. And really, if, if an institution wants to affect change, a leader needs to change, um, needs to be here for really about 10 years, I think the research would show for change and transformation. And so I think it's critical that we don't create a rotating door, um, especially based on something like salary. Uh, so I would say that um, I think there's different philosophies. We'll continue to hear on this as we continue to hire. But a question I have um, is, is this, would this model, and you talked a little bit, and I think when we look at compression or some of the, the incoming salaries versus salaries for those that are here that we want to retain, would this model then be applied, whether it's somebody's first employment agreement or 20th employment agreement? Uh, uh, Chair Mayron, uh, Regent Davenport, I. We, we do go through this iteration when um, updated agreements or amendments are, are requested if it involves salary for senior leaders. We do often get engaged in that and review it at that time and see what the, the market is. Um, you know, and that, that can be a different decision than when someone is first coming into a role and uh, is maybe at a different stage of their career. Mary, do you have any thoughts? I would just add that each year, you know, we, we will be here in May, or Ken yep. will be here in May, um, to show the market data for all the senior leaders. And that's probably the best time to be looking at what those percentiles are for each person and asking that question. 
you know, how have they been performing? What has been the experience of that individual? And is that percentile hitting correctly? And the same theory should be applied. You know, applied for the new candidate, applied for the people you're bringing in. But then that, that is the purpose of bringing that annual market data forward is so you can take a look at that, keep an eye on it. There's not always ability to make a change every year, but if you do that annual review, that's just a very good, um, good measure to take to keep salaries um, competitive. Thank you. Anything further? I have more, but I have a whole. <laughs> okay. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, yeah, I too agree that it's it's nice to have this conversation, you know, in this general setting. So I appreciate that being included um, in in the work plan. Uh, Regent Davenport, I, the, yeah, the order you end up in can really screw up your comments <laughs> and what you had, what you had anticipated saying. But I, I just wanted to comment on something you said before I, I go to mine. You, you talked about that rotating door. Now that that's not good for you know, uh, um, affecting change, you know, obviously. But I would just comment that, in my opinion anyway, um, attempting to pay, you know, 90 percentile or whatever actually incentivizes that because everyone knows the, I mean, the best way to get a raise is to get a different job. It's true in my industry. I think it's true in a lot of industries. But having that goal actually incentivizes that rotating. Our people want to go elsewhere and other people want to come here because I think it's the easiest way to get the biggest jump. Um, I, I guess I won't surprise anyone with my comments, but I mean, I, I do think there's some, some really good guidelines and, and principles here. Um, you know, obviously looking at experience, obviously um, the, the job as well. I think those things all matter. Um, I do think some localization makes sense in certain situations, um, obviously with respect to housing per se, right? I mean, your, your peers, you know, may not be the same for that or, um, you know, I think there's, there's certain positions that have a peer group outside higher education. Um, and I'll, I'll use examples broadly. Obviously, you know, a provost, the peer group is, is very much tied to higher education, but maybe a VP of university services, you would be looking at city managers, locally and, and, and elsewhere as peers because the, the functions are the same, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know in some of those situations that would support my general feeling and some it doesn't support it. We're talking IT and whatnot, looking broadly. So I, I understand that. Um, but, you know, yeah, I do, I do the other principle I approach this from and I, I don't think I saw it in the presentation and I think that's where some of us disagree is just... Um, a public service element. I, I didn't have the benefit of seeing higher education evolve, uh, benefit or burden, depending um, how you describe it. Um, but you know, I still do think there is a public service element. Um, is I mean, what we're all doing here is is paid service in a lot of settings, but it's not here because because of you know the public service element of it. Last week was computer science education week and I got to spend a lot of the week at various elementary schools teaching fourth and fifth graders how to code uh, which was very fun um, but you know I got to spend some time in that setting and talk to the teachers and I you know no one I mean I certainly wouldn't assert that they're paid 40 grand a year because of their quality or, or because of their qualifications or anything like that um, they, they educate your children and you know um, mine one day as well. So, you know, that's just a component that um, is being lost in, in the conversation. And I, I mean, I, I would like, and you know, there, maybe it's not the first ranking, but, you know, I, I wish it'd be somewhere in the conversation. And then um, talk about consistency, and Regent Rocha brought it up, consistency among um, other groups, right? You know, uh, uh, among faculty and, and labor and, and whatnot. I mean, I just, I just don't know that we always think of it this way. Um, we've seen some faculty comparison. I think in, in some departments, in some colleges, it's really good, and in other places, um, and especially throughout the system, it's actually not, you know, very good. But, you know, we just don't, we don't look at a retention issue or, or a DFW rate, and, and I just don't hear anyone suggesting that, um, um, our compensation of the academic advisors is the problem and, the, and the, that that's how we're going to solve, you know, that issue and increase. So, I, I mean, I think it's a good conversation. I, I hope this isn't the last of it. Um, 
but I would, I mean, I would urge us to just reconsider some of those things in terms of public service. And then also, fine, I mean, then let's apply these policies to, or principles to, to everyone at the university. But I, I do appreciate the, the information presentation. I, I don't know if there was a question in there. <laughs> I'm not sure there was. If you find one, have at it. <laughs> if not, thank you. All right. Any other comments or discussion? I will just share that uh, from my own perspective, I think the approach you're taking uh, is the way to go. I support it. I think it's sufficiently nuanced to take into account the, the multitude of variables that go into an employment agreement and in particular into compensation. I think uh, taking a very broad brush uh, approach to say uh, that the comparable field for public servants across the board is the same and judges should be the pay, is paid the same as the council a person on a city council any more than I think you could lump all nonprofits together and say anybody who works for a nonprofit that's the market you look at and it doesn't matter how big it is how much revenue it generates the skill set you just focus on that particular industry and you'd broadly define it as nonprofits. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a mistake and I, I think your approach to this in terms of what you look to the market, you're obviously looking to many, many variables and clearly you will be looking to the public service component of anyone who works for higher education. I can see that's part of your analysis but it doesn't end there and, and I think that's really critical. So uh, I personally support the approach that you're taking and, and providing us with all this information is highly useful as we evaluate a, a job offers and employment agreements that get presented to us for senior leaders. All right, any other comments or discussion? Well then, hearing none, thank you very much thank to our you. presenters. We're gonna take a 10 minute recess. Uh, actually, we're gonna take a, yeah, a 10 minute recess except I'm going to call the 10 minutes to say we will be back at, uh, let's come back at 2.55 p.m. 10 minutes, except not 10 minutes. Not ten, it's like yeah. 12 minutes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, short okay. break. Thank you.
What the hell is that? Hope everybody had a lovely break. Took a look at the weather outside. Didn't freak out. All right. At this time, I call the Finance and Operations Committee back to order. Our fifth item continues our development of the fiscal year 2024 annual operating budget after we acted on the fiscal year 2024-25 biennial budget request in October. Vice President Tonneson is here to lead us through the materials. Vice President Tonneson, if you would like to proceed. He always sneaks up on me. <laughs> Thank you, Skeeter, uh, very much. I appreciate it. That's right. Right back at it. Rerun. Well, thank you very much, Vice <coughs> President Tonneson. Any discussion? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Be, yeah, great. We can have a conversation. No, uh, good there afternoon, you. everybody. Uh, briefly, and by way of introducing this topic today, uh, our focus is on an overview of the primary revenue and expenditure variables that drive the budget every year. We will discuss trends and the current status of those variables to gain your input and to provide some information and background uh, on the budget overall and the budget process. At the February board meeting, we will bring for discussion more refined estimates for the different revenue and expense variables. And then finally, the president will deliver her recommended fully balanced FY24 operating budget for your review and action in June, hopefully incorporating our finalized state appropriation if they complete their process on time. We can be optimistic. Uh, very quickly, I'd like to remind everyone why we distinguish between what we call the primary discretionary funds in the budget framework, that's the unrestricted O&M appropriation and tuition versus all other revenues. Most of tuition and the O&M appropriation are planned at the high institutional level for the purposes of best addressing budgetary needs and initiatives, really to support literally all aspects of our mission, the direct programming as well as the associated overhead. All other revenues are then everything else, which I will touch on more later in the presentation. The full recommended budget you will receive in June incorporates all of these revenues and their corresponding estimated expenditures. It is an all funds budget. However, much of our conversation with you focuses on the state appropriation and tuition portion of this picture because of the decisions that are necessary at the institutional level to complete the budget. So turning to the variables and levers, the purpose of today, I'm first going to address the spending trends and categories that will drive some of our decisions. This chart shows total expenditures from 2012 to 2022 adjusted for inflation. The maroon bars show total expenditures for all non-sponsored funds combined adjusted to $2012, and the gold bars reflect the same thing for just the state and tuition funds portion of those totals. From this view of total expenditures, there are a couple of interesting messages, I think. First, for all funds combined, the maroon, our spending has grown over the prior year, every year but one, with a total growth over 10 years of 6.1% but that growth has been at an average annual rate of only 0.7% and still under 2% even if you exclude the COVID year. And that's happening even while our scope and our activity levels have increased. Second message, our spending of state and tuition dollars has actually decreased over the last 10 years when adjusted for inflation. In total, 5.1% and at a rate annualized over the 10 years of 0.4% which is evidence of spending controls, but also increased reliance on other revenues within our overall portfolio. The results at the university level like this do mask real budgetary challenges in managing cost increases for some items that routinely increase and outpace general inflation. We have to address those cost increases, and we have done so in part through our internal process to force reprioritization of existing resources which is actually made possible by the type of actions highlighted on this next slide. Each year, we ask our units to manage an internal reallocation process that results in their decisions to use these tools to free up existing resources and other tools that they may bring to the table. They have had to reach for opportunities to do more or the same 
with at less cost. Partly because many of our units have reached a point where further significant reallocation will force a decrease in service or output in the near future, the institution recently, recently embarked on the PEAK initiative, which I won't detail right now. But for our purposes today, it's important to note that the changes coming through that initiative will take the tools highlighted in gold here from the unit level to the institutional level. I also want to mention that you will not see cost savings from PEAK incorporated into the FY24 budget. This initiative is phasing in changes over a three-year time period. And because this, any savings derived from these efforts will vary by unit, the full net impact of the changes will not be known until all units have completed implementation. We've set up an internal monitoring plan so that the conclusion of implementation, we will be able to identify productivity gains, estimates of future cost avoidance, and actual net budget savings. And at that time, we will be able to recognize the impact in the annual budget, but not until that point. Turning now to the most pertinent cost variables in, for planning the FY24 budget, we'll talk through some history and background information for each of these primary cost drivers we anticipate for next year's budget. Compensation, which is always a top budget item to address, uh, utilities and debt, maintenance of our technology infra infrastructure, and some needs in the area of compliance and safety. As this table shows, in eight of the 10 years prior to this year, the university implemented general salary pool increases at roughly the rate of inflation or even slightly above until we came to FY21 and FY22, in which we froze all but bargaining unit salaries one year and implemented a small across the board increase the next, both in response to the budgetary impacts of COVID-19. Those modest increases allowed us to keep up with recruitment and retention needs for many of our job categories, but not for all of them. Then with the onset of pandemic recovery in the economy, significant increases in inflation, and a decrease in the number of people seeking employment, particularly in some areas, the labor markets and our own goals to attract and retain talent required us to implement a significantly higher salary pool this year. And there are no signs right now that lead us to believe a return to the 2 to 2.5% two range of increase will be acceptable. In fact, the state of Minnesota just released their November forecast last week, and embedded within that it is, is an assumed annual increase in wage and salary disbursements of 4 to 5% beginning this year and through FY27. That's for the state forecast. As you are aware, the annual budget we bring to you each spring includes the estimated cost for delivering an overall increase in the salary pool of a certain percent, plus the associated fringe benefits. The decision to increase that overall salary pool and at what specific percent is largely based on three considerations. First, what is generally happening inside the organizations with which we compete for talent, as you were just discussing a little bit. Second, we look at what is happening with the cost of living for our employees. The most recent inflation rates remain high at just over 7%, but most experts are predicting a gradual decline back to that 2 to 2.5% two range, beginning in calendar 23 and into the next several years. And finally, we must consider what's happening with the other costs within the university and the revenue sources available to pay the increases. Costs are high and unrestricted revenue growth is constrained. Across all our units and funds, we're currently estimating a fringe increase of $12 million if there is no salary increase, and we will have to find an additional $26 million for each 1% increase in the salary pool. If you isolate that to just the O&M appropriation and tuition portion of the budget, the costs are half of those numbers. That represents half of our total comp. In the end, it's a balancing act between these different forces that leads us to a decision on what to include in the budget for planning. And beyond the general increase in the merit pool, there are wage pressures right now in a number of areas that may impact our budget plans for the next couple of years. The combined general pressures of external market competition for talent, which includes both attracting and retaining employees, and internal equity considerations across units and activities are issues. And again, you just discussed a bit of that in the previous uh, agenda item. 
Right now, we are aware of, and the institution and individual units have implemented or are thinking about strategies to address these types of issues for a variety of employee groups that you see here. Again, these are pressures that would fall on top of the general merit pool increases we will want to implement, and they could cost us millions of dollars. While compensation is the largest gorilla in the budget room, for FY24, we cannot forget that we will be faced with other significant uh, cost increases that are on this chart. The three most significant categories outside of compensation are shown here. For facilities, the two drivers you see listed here will present unavoidable cost increases. Utilities are projected to increase 8 to 9% next year, largely driven by electric rates and a nationwide increase in natural gas prices. Across all our campuses, this could add up to $10 million to our current utility budget. For debt service, we're seeing the impact of the new off-site collection facility for university libraries, the cost of the microbial cell production facility, as well as some smaller projects and land purchases in our current estimates. The $5 million increase in cost identified here as an estimate is roughly a 10% increase over this year's budget. Depending on the project, some units have identified revenue sources to pay for that debt, but other projects, such as the library facility, cannot rely on revenues generated by the activity in the new space, so the overall university budget will need to incorporate that cost. A similar situation exists for technology. Negotiated vendor contracts often require an increase of $1 to $2 million, and we're seeing that again for next year. The $6 million estimate shown here reflects increased demand for development, maintenance, and security enhancements, all items that are required, and we will work to apply any peak-related productivity enhancements to address them as we move forward into the future, but we must face them in the short term. And finally, we've been implementing a number of changes to enhance safety and security on our campuses, and we are aware of a broad set of needs that fall into the overall compliance category of spending, which often overlaps with safety. We will be refining the list of needs and requirements in this area through the budget process. We've been meeting with our support units, and we'll gather more information when we meet with our ac academic units on what specifically those needs are. Moving to the resource variables in our budget framework, we will briefly walk through some background information related to the state appropriation, tuition, our internal reallocation process, and any other revenues that we can bring to the table. First, the state appropriation. At $713.7 million each year of this biennium, without adjusting for inflation, the appropriation has slightly exceeded, or really just met uh, now, what the university received 15 years ago. Adjusting for inflation using CPI, an appropriation of $708.8 million in FY08, that's that period, previous peak, would have the same buying power as $960 million today, which is $246 million more than our actual appropriation. Even prior to recent inflation impacts, the gap was routinely in the $140 to $180 million range. That means other sources of revenue and cost controls have been necessary to fill that gap over time. As you approved in October, we submitted a request to the state of Minnesota to increase our base appropriation by $80 million in FY24 and an additional $45 million in FY25. That very modest increase would begin to close the gap represented on the previous side if inflation is, falls just a bit. In combination with our part of the proposed partnership, the requested $45 million increase in each year for core mission support in particular would greatly improve our ability to cover the projected costs that I just discussed. The Minnesota Resident Scholarship Proposal and the requested items to enhance public safety are pivotal in being able to move toward improved outcomes in those critical areas. If those items are not funded, it will mean, at best, delays in implementing those changes and, at worst, elimination of those changes from our plans. On tuition, this year our revenue is projected to come in at roughly $990 million. You can see here projected revenues from the various tuition paying <coughs> student populations that were built into this year's budget. The actual amount of tuition revenue received is impacted by a variety of things, including the tuition rates and enrollment, the obvious ones, but also course registrations or credits per student, the mix of students, 
resident versus non-resident and so forth, and the portion of students receiving waivers. Our best estimate using trend data at the college and campus level and assuming no overall change in enrollment is that each 1% increase in the rate would yield 9.5 million in new revenue. Among the decisions we make that most directly impact tuition revenue, clearly the rate is the most impactful. Over the last 10 years, the average annual increase in the resident undergraduate tuition rate has been 1.6% on the Twin Cities campus with three years at 0%, and ranging from 0.97 to 0.9% on the system campuses with five years out of the 10 at 0%. Today, on the Twin Cities campus, the resident undergraduate rate plus fees ranks five out of 13 institutions in the Big Ten, if you exclude Northwestern. And although we had reached a ranking of seven out of 13 for the undergraduate non-resident rate, that has fallen again to ninth. The system campus rates uh, continue to be on the high end compared to most of the schools which was, with which they compete for talent, and you have seen that as they have come and presented to you on their enrollment strategies. The tuition rate chosen for the various groups is a conscious decision each year, factoring in student demand and balancing the real costs faced by the institution, the availability of other resources to take the place of tuition, concerns we, are all, we all have regarding the student's ability to pay, and the corresponding availability of financial aid. Enrollment changes are factored into budget revenue estimates as well. For the Rochester campus, we are anticipating continued growth consistent with their campus plans. For the Twin Cities campus, we will likely see relatively stable enrollment next year, uh, maybe some growth in non-resident uh, students and some growth in the freshman class, but, sta but stable. And we will work with each college on the specific changes that they are seeing on this campus. For Crookston, Duluth, and Morris, we've been experiencing lower enrollments than anticipated in the budget, so we will work with them to arrive at realistic estimates, hopefully stabilizing at current levels at the very least. Approval of our request for the Minnesota Scholarship Program would help a great deal in achieving that stabilization and even perhaps some growth in enrollment. The third resource category I wanted to summarize today is what we've been calling reallocations. This is our internal practice of finding efficiencies or purposely reducing or eliminating expenditures on a recurring basis in order to reinvest existing resources elsewhere. The amount of planned internal budget cuts as included in the board approved budget for the last 12 years is displayed on this line chart. While some years stand out as particularly high or low, for the majority of the years, we implemented reallocations hovering around 1%. Moving forward, we have to choose how deep to push the budget reductions for FY24. Preliminarily, we have instructed units to provide plans for a 0.85% reduction. As we move through the process, we will refine those targets in total and by unit. The combination of relatively smaller increases in our state appropriation decisions made to hold tuition rate increases under the rate of inflation, the expansion of our scope and impact and inflation has meant that we have not been able to balance the budget without this internal reallocation process. Finally, we have become more reliant over time on growth in other revenues to fully support our activities, as I pointed out earlier. So what are we talking about specifically in that space? In the interest of time, I won't define, uh, or, and actually your interest, I won't define each for you today, uh, but hopefully most are familiar to you, and if you have questions in the discussion, we can certainly uh, provide more information. But for the relative magnitude of these revenues, we can look to this chart. It shows for FY23 the total approved budget included projected revenues in these categories of $2.4 billion, so just over half our total revenues for the year. And just over half of these funds, in red here, are restricted to unit or purpose. They help us support the direct costs of critical programs and mission work, but they bring three primary challenges. They cannot be redeployed to many of the costs that we talked about earlier in this presentation. Many of the gifts and restricted grants are for a defined period of time, so they are non-recurring. And finally, the funding from grantors generally does not fully support the institutional costs required to conduct research. They are key for our success, but these restricted funds come with budgeting challenges. 
And the last note relative to these revenues is that they are not equally generated and available across all units. What is available to help with mission work in one unit may not be in another or not to the same extent due to the specific work being done. Within the budget process, it's expected that the units will do the work to grow these revenues to cover all cost increases for the activities that they pay for, and even where possible, to move into relieving some of the pressure on the O&M tuition side of the budget. If they cannot grow the revenue for some reason, then the units are expected to lower costs in these activities and balance those budgets that way. Moving from the high level institutional totals for a minute, many of you have seen this chart before. It shows the diversity of revenues at the academic unit level, and it carries several messages. First, the size of these units varies significantly. Second, every one of these units receives some amount of state appropriation, which is the lime green color. And third, probably most relevant for today's discussion, it helps to demonstrate that varying reliance on other revenues that I just mentioned. The lime green, the state appropriation, and the royal blue tuition uh, represent the framework revenues. If you exclude those, for units like the College of Liberal Arts on the Twin Cities campus, the Carlson School, or the Morris campus, there's very little left in their revenue arsenal. If you look at units like the Medical School, CFANS, the College of Veterinary Medicine, and others, their activities are generating sales or clinical income, sponsored grants, ICR, and non-sponsored contracts in larger <clears throat> proportions. There is risk with reliance on the other revenues and more to manage, but there is also more opportunity. And it's important to understand that the options for some units to grow these resources are greater than for other units. That is in part why we approach each unit separately in making decisions to arrive at a strong and balanced budget overall. Finally, this chart serves as a good opportunity to point out that we actually go through the budget process attempting to address the issues and priorities for each individual unit. These on this chart, as well as the many support and auxiliary units that do not appear here. When we balance at the institutional level, we balance here first, and then add it all up in a way that delivers a comprehensive, strategic, and balanced budget for the institution. I will mention while I'm on this chart that the, the, the uh, Sorry, what's it called? At the bottom that, that identifies the colors is missing the dark blue color in that legend. It, the, that is grants and contracts. For some reason, it fell off of the chart. I apologize for that. So in that budget process, oops, sorry. Hmm, this version is missing a couple of slides. Let me just tell you, I'll wrap it up by saying, in the budget process, the president is the one that decides on how to build the variables that we've discussed today into the recommended operating budget you will see in June. And to get to these recommendations, there is an internal process that I alluded to that involves the chancellors, the deans, and the vice presidents relying on them to build budget responses that directly correspond to their unit level and university level strategic plans and goals. They're also responsible for identifying financial challenges for their units and proposing solutions, sometimes in partnership with the university. And it's a very distributed budget management model, but all designed to make each unit as successful as possible while achieving overall university goals, which in turn leads to a stronger institution. The process to arrive at that point it actually begins with today's discussion. So let me close my comments um, by a setup for the February meeting. In February, we will have a chance to review these variables in more detail with more specific information. We will bring forward uh, kind of a math game to help you think through the impacts that can happen on the budget as you change those variables. And we will be asking questions about what to do with these variables. If you have priority, uh, statements you want to make about them, direction related to state appropriation, tuition, reallocation, compensation, and so forth, there will be more opportunity between now and then to think that through and to have a further conversation in February. So with that, Madam Chair, I close my comments and we'd be happy to have a conversation if you wish to do that today. Thank you. Do you have your next slide on the materials? Oh, you don't have it. All right. Was the... Uh, I'll, say, I'll read what it says here. It says, what does the board think about the variables given the uncertainties of today? And on the left side was resources, which included tuition strategy, enrollment, maintenance, or growth and impact on metrics, 
cutting budgets and reallocating resources beyond that needed to <clears throat> offset revenue losses, other thoughts. And on the cost side, it included compensation strategy, reducing budgets by reducing scope in some cases, magnitude of investment in strategic plan initiatives, other thoughts. So with that, uh, any discussion or questions? I'm sorry, Regent Powell. Oh, Regent Powell. Okay. Um, thank you, um, as Julie as ever, and thank you that I think it's great that we start this process early. Um, so I have I have um, three three questions or comments. The first one is, um, do you have a a sense for um, what the trend line for administrative costs? You know, over the last several years, I've seen a few numbers that says that it is declining as a percent, um, and also, you know, through I think really well implemented programs for, during the pandemic um, uh, around early retirement and that sort of thing, the, the, the employees, you know, it has also declined, um, and um, so the the question is, is it declining? Because I think it's important that it is, and if it is, that's really important. To say, I mean, that we're actually we are really truly making progress on that. Yes, uh, Chair Mayron, uh, Regent Paul. Yes, it is declining. It has declined through FY22. Uh, our most recent update of the definition of administrative costs uh, and the metric that's part of Impact 2025 uh, are identifies our goal as remaining between 10 and roughly 11 and percent of total expenditures. And the last three years we've gone from, I think it was 11.6 to 10 point, I, I don't have it in front of me, but upper 10 point something, and then now it's even lower for FY22. So it has dropped. That is a function of personnel. It's also a function of uh, sometimes the amount of one-time large expenditures that are made. And so you will see, I'm just foreshadowing here, you're going to see some ups and downs. Uh, it won't always go down, but our goal is to remain in that range, even if it goes up a tenth or two from year to year. Okay, C couple more quick ones. Yeah, I, I just want to make, and that's before we implement peak. So this, we're seeing this trend that you're talking about going down. Y yes, Madam okay. Chair, that is correct. Uh, all right. Go ahead, Regent Powell. Well, it's, I was, I was going to make your point, which is I, I do think that two things. I think that um, given, you know, we probably were all trying to add up, you know, some of these numbers that you're giving, but it, it seems like there's really a tough budget problem to solve as we go into next year, really tough. And I think that um, we just, uh, we somehow we have to find more, whether you call it reallocation, I call it productivity. I just, mm -hmm. I just think we're going to have to find more. I don't know where or how, but I think we have to. Um, and the third thing is I'll um, channel um, Regent Verhalen. I, given the, the inflationary challenges, I don't, I, I don't know if 80 and 40, you know, is enough <laughs> for, from mm -hmm. the, it just, because I, I'm worried that by the time we, you know, plug in the numbers that we have and all the inflationary increases, even if there's more productivity, we're looking at um, a tuition sort of solution that we're not going to like. And um, and so I'm just con I'm just concerned that we you know, maybe this is the time to we just need more, we just need more from the state or because I mean, we're doing what we should do. We're doing productivity. We're doing peak. We're reducing admin. We're doing the things that we should do, but we're in an inflationary environment, and we can't solve it all. Um, and so anyway, that's, that's the comment. Okay, thank you. Um, any response or? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Regent Powell, other than I agree, I would love to have more, more state money. I mean, obviously, that would be fabulous, and it will be challenging. You are absolutely correct. Uh, b before I move on to our next uh, region for questions, one of the things that we said we'd look back to you about was the impact of the um, of the union contracts, what impact that has on the budget. Um, so do you want to share that with us? Sure. Uh, Regent Mayron, uh, members of the committee, uh, the way I think it's best to think about this, to translate it, the information that Vice President Horseman shared is, is real information and for what it is. When you take that information and translate it into the bu budget, I think it's helpful to think about it as he, as he started to, which is splitting it. You have to kind of categorize it between this year's impact 
and how much that went over and above what we had planned for in the budget. That has a recurring impact, but then separate out the increases for 24 and 25, and I'll explain that in a minute. If you just look at this year, uh, the, as, as I've worked with OHR and the numbers and triangulated that with some units and their estimates, uh, our estimate for all of the contracts that you just approved is about a $3.7 million impact over and above what we had planned in the budget across all funds and all units. So keep in mind a large percentage of these cost increases are in our auxiliaries, our food and housing and, um, housing and dining uh, programs and so forth, and about 50%, so that's about 40% is there, about 50% of the cost is in the O&M and tuition part of the budget, and 10% is everywhere else. Um, so that 3.7 million will be a one-time cost this year that units will use balances for, or we will find institutional balances for to help them uh, pay for that cost. It's like an inflation cost, as, as something coming in over inflation, but it is spread. Moving into 24 and 25, the 4% increases that are included in the um, contract will be part of our compensation planning as, as one of the variables we just talked through, so we can plan for it on the front end. We will, I can't tell you today exactly what that is uh, for those employee groups, but we will be calculating that and planning it along with the other compensation considerations for 24 and 25. I hope that's helpful. So in other words, inflation has had a huge impact, has had an impact, and we're going to have to figure out how we're going to pay for it, whether it's through tuition or revenues, to, or tuition ask from the state, expense reduction, but the fact is we have to cover that increase due to inflation that was really out of our control. Yes, Madam Chair, that is, that we have to build that into our framework for FY24 and 25. Okay, thank you. Senior Vice President. Oh, Senior Vice President of France. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Vice President Tonneson. I would also want to say about the compensation increases, especially the ones that were negotiated, I think we need to be also cognizant. It's not, um, it's not just inflation. It's the fact that the, you know, the, the opportunity for us to en enhance and increase our pay schedule for the university and for these folks who do such great work for us this is really an important step for us going forward to make a real positive statement that uh, uh, to the extent we can support these contract uh, demands and increase the pay for the folks who every day uh, provide the incredible service to this university throughout all five campuses and we just couldn't operate without them. So I, I just, just want to make sure that we realize we are also stepping up, I think, in a situation where the pay for these um, different jobs needs to be increased. And I think we succeeded in that beginning of that. There's more to do, but that's part of what we're doing here too, I believe. Thank you. Excellent point. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Regent Sviggum. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Julie, you are a magician. <laughs> and you must have been well-trained in a former occupation that you had, at least in the, the place of employment. You must have been well-trained. Um, my question to you is that I want to enter into this eyes wide open. Um, I want you to put some easy numbers together for me. And, and I say, say eyes wide open, folks, because it's going to be tough to reconcile this the way it looks to me. Um, and Regent Kenyana, I'm not going to be here next year when you vote on the budget in June to, to help you pass it or change it or whatever. I won't be here. I will be sitting in my tractor and I'm saying, what the heck are you doing, Kenyatta? <laughs> uh, I'm looking at these numbers and tell me, tell me if I'm wrong and help me. $45 million core emission request from the legislature. Mm -hmm. Let's just suppose we get that because we ought about a $17 billion budget although a lot of it be one time. Mm -hmm. we, sh we should be able to get that money. So let's assume that, that thing. Um, you look at what we've done in regards to uh, uh, reallocations uh, amongst the units, and you've talked about that as being a possible answer. Julie, we've been reallocating for six years, seven years okay. since I've been here on the board, maybe before then. Operation Excellence, all of it, but we've been reallocating. What was in that, 90 million uh, mm -hmm. under President Kaler? And, mm -hmm. I mean, we've been reallocating. I don't know how much more the 
units can take. Mr. Horseman will tell you that we've reduced our FTEs by 986 folks. Mm -hmm. FTEs, okay, and maybe he can do more, uh, but, but that's a significant amount. That's, uh, what, that's about 3.5% of our uh, employee uh, population. And, and I'm, I'm building the base here. The, the salary increase, you know, 1% uh, salary increase is 26 million, fringe in. Plus 12 of fringe. I thought 26 was with fringe in. That's the increment. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, um, uh, Regent Spigum. With a 0% increase, fringe will go up 12 million. Yeah. With each 1% increase in salary, the total salary and the fringe associated with that increment goes up 26. So it's 12 plus 26 for each 1%. So 39. Okay, so maybe just a little more costly than I was anticipating in my back of the envelope yeah. then which works against my figure in right here. <laughs> um, and, and then you look at the uh, tuition increase, 1%, you know, somewhere around 9 million, all in, all mm -hmm. units, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, you put all these numbers together, and, and there's numbers, I'm, I'm just hitting the bigger points, as, as you know. I want our eyes to be wide open next June, as we move to next June. What type of a tuition increase are we backing into? Uh, Madam Chair, Regent Spigum, it really does depend on, I mean, there are costs that are unavoidable. That is true. But there are also costs that we learn about through the budget process that I can't tell you what those are today, but needs, those compliance needs, those safety needs, those, you know, programmatic needs that come through the budget process. So depending on how big that pool is, Depending, the other variable to keep in mind is the other revenues, the growth in the other revenues that can, can, that can pay for some of this. So honestly, uh, I'm not really a magician, but I can do the simple math, uh, you know, trying to put those together in different ways and trying to corral the decisions in a way that, that helps us balance all of that. So tuition, it, you know, we don't, generally don't think about setting tuition to fill the gap to balance the budget, we think about what is the reasonable rate that we want to charge balancing all of those things and balancing the impact on students. So we might say, uh, you know, if we wanted to balance the budget with the amount of investment we really w would like to do and put it and say we're gonna use tuition to, to balance it, it would be a high increase, but we won't do that. Okay. Um, oh. we, we will shape the investments and we will plan on other changes in the variables to get to a, a rate that uh, the president feels is responsible and uh, uh, fair, uh, given all of the other variables that we're dealing with. Madam Chair, Julie, thank you. I, I, I understand you want some flexibility in your comments and you uh, don't want to lock us into a number. Uh, and you can't, I understand, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of costs that you know, we're not going to be able to control. Energy costs are going to go up, for instance. Absolutely. Uh, you know, um, the way it looked in the back of my envelope, it looked like about 6 to 7% tuition. And it, it won't be that. I understand it won't be. We can't do that. We, no. we simply can't do it. But if we only get $45 million from them, if the salaries compensations we just voted for 45 minutes ago will go up, that's 4% plus. Um, and you know, the, uh, maybe we can squeeze more out of the units in the departments, but you know, we've been reallocating for a long time. <laughs> you know, I, I'd hate to go to all those deans and say, well, you've got to reallocate for the eighth time now, you know, because they've been doing it. I, I know six years and you shook your head it was before that. Yes. So, Eyes wide open, folks. Eyes wide open. Uh, this is this is going to be really, really tough. And and Kenyana, I'm not going to be here to help you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Regent Spigum. I mean, I think what you're hearing, and maybe the administration is hearing, we're wondering whether the 45 million is is enough to ask from the legislature. And similarly, when you come back to the capital budget, uh, and we talk about 200 million, whether that's enough either and whether it's time to increase those amounts particularly in a year when the state has a significant surplus uh, we you know we're not likely to see that again so if not now then probably never so 
I think that's one of the takeaways from some of the comments here. Uh, we're, we're beyond what I allocated here, but I do want to make sure we get all our comments, but I'll ask our uh, regents to be succinct. So next, uh, Regent Davenport, you're always succinct. Um, thank you, Chair. Most of what I wanted to ask or say has been said or asked, but I think um, we do need to focus on whether things are one-time money or base money, and I think that's different with when the state Bases a surplus. And then the second thing I, I'll just say is I have great appreciation for all the work that's done throughout campus, whether it's reallocation or just these budget challenges, um, they're, they're very tough. And people know how to go about um, addressing them and they do that, but that doesn't make it any easier. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, Regent you know, Powell and Regent Sviggum have both um, spoke to how tough this is. I've got a few years on this board. I don't ever remember us saying this is easy. <laughs> so it's, it's always a, 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 these challenges. You know, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that you know, with the, the political dynamic at the state level I, that we'll do a little better um, than we might have, and uh, I think that's good. Um, I, I note, Regent Sviggum, that reallocation is a constant. I don't, you know, I, I wouldn't want it to be any other way because we're a constantly evolving uh, enterprise. And so uh, I, I don't, you know, I, I agree with you, it's a, it's a challenge, but you know, I think it's an important one and a, and a, and a welcome one. Um, I also note that when we talk about the legislature and where the legislature is going to put its money, that we're also part of a market there as well because we're competing with a lot of government agencies and a lot of state agencies. And so while we compare ourselves to other universities that are you know, paying substantially more than most public uh, positions, the legislature sees that too. And that has an impact on where they see the, the strongest need. So I think we should be mindful of that. And just the last thing I'll do, and uh, um, you know, uh, take this opportunity, um, when you, as we're making these decisions, you know, when you look at the, the university's charter, which is getting kind of old now, about 170 some years ago, it says the admission fee to the university and the charges for tuition in the several departments thereof shall be regulated and prescribed by the Board of Regents. And as soon as, in, as soon as in their opinion, the income of the university fund will permit, tuition in all the departments shall be without charge to all students in the same who are residents of the territory. So clearly the intent was to provide affordable education, affordable, uh, education to the industrious classes was the term that was used at the time. So we're trying to make sure that folks that don't have tremendous means have, an ac have access to a University of Minnesota education. I, wanna, I always want to keep that at the forefront when we're having these conversations because you, know, you, can, you can put together an emergency medical services company and make sure that you're covering all your costs and, and you're keeping your, your staff well, well compensated, but if in the end you don't you're not able to save the patient, you're not really meeting your mission. And I, if we're taking away the ability for students to get an education at the University of Minnesota um, without being saddled with essentially a lifetime of debt, we will have failed no matter how excellent we think we are. And, and to that extent, I just note that we are, among our regional peers, we are quite expensive for a public uh, 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 flagship university. So as we make those decisions, I, want to, I just want to keep pushing that point because the other points will all be very well made and appropriately made. But uh, in that balance, I really want to make sure we look at affordability. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Regent Hipsch? I'll be quick. I think the, um, the two things we haven't mentioned are, are the headwinds that we're seeing in the markets. And we have tremendous income coming off of our returns in our markets, and, and those are coming too, and I, you know, I mean, they've been good this year yet, but I don't know how far they can go forward with that with today's stock market especially. And the second thing uh, I just want to mention is that one of the things businesses do, and we'll probably do it too, is we tend to cut our discretionary uh, expenses to try to save money in bad times, and that's marketing and stuff like that. And so when we have less students in the pipeline and we're competing for less students and we cut marketing, that's going to exacerbate the problem. So we have to be really careful that we don't uh, cut our marketing because that's going to really hurt us in the long run, I think. We need to get those extra 1,000 students, as uh, Regent Swiggum says. So um, even though these are mar markets are tough, so those are two points I'd like to make. Thank you, Regent Hipsch. 
a student representative, Sarah Davis. Thank you, Chair Mayeron. Um, Vice President Tonneson, thank you for this presentation today. I wanted to mention as well how encouraging it is as a student to hear that those tuition increases that Regent Sviggum was speaking on, that those out of control costs are not something that's necessarily going to be a burden on, us, on the students. And I appreciate the, um, the efforts that your office puts into ensuring that students can afford that equitable, equitable education. Um, and I wanted to add as well, while we're speaking about compensation, compensation strategies and those reallocation uh, measures from departments that a lot of the, the ways that some of those departments have dealt with those things are um, like faculty and, and hiring faculty on contract basis and like semester to semester. And I think that kind of serves to, to exacerbate the problem because you're not going to be able to retain faculty when they are un uncertain about their own positions and those that revolving door that we were speaking to earlier is only going to exacerbate, I think, the, the crisis situation that we're absolutely seeing here today. So from a student perspective, that's encouraging to hear, but also, yeah, I think we need to look at, our, at the money that we're requesting from the state and see what we can do to help prevent future students from having this burden faced upon them. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent comments. All right, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, this was a very uh, robust discussion, very much appreciated. And we will move on to the next item, which is uh, our next item is review and action on the resolution related to the purchase of 325-329 14th Avenue Southeast Minneapolis, Minneapolis, an establishment of and investment in 325 14th Avenue Southeast LLC. At this time, I invite Assistant Vice President Leslie Krieger to outline the resolution. Uh, but first, uh, Senior Vice President Franz, would you like to get us started? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, the next item regarding the purchase of the property at 325 and 329 14th Avenue Southeast is a unique one. The building sits at the heart of Dinky Town. Uh, most of you know exactly where it is. It's been and continues to be an important community hub near our Twin Cities campus in terms of the Dinkytown uh, situation. We believe that the university has an important role to play in ensuring a bright future for this area. President Gable's vision for a strategic and targeted investment in key properties includes Dinkytown as one way to help preserve the historic character of the area, diversify commercial real estate, and commercial retail and serve the needs of the community. This strategic vision includes preserving the historic character and the charm of the neighborhood. Part of that historic character in Dickytown has been the existence of dining options, including sit-down dining that the prior owners of this property offered. Retaining an in-person dining option provides our community more choice, provides weekend and evening dining for patrons of our on-campus events, and creates a vibrancy of the neighborhood that we've seen in Dickey Town. This purchase also supports our work to improve safety around the Twin Cities campus by demonstrating clearly the university's commitment to the, to the neighborhood's vitality and the ability to attract renters and other visitors. We support Dickey Town as a compelling destination for everyone who visits and lives there, including students, faculty, staff, neighbors, families, and others. Following this purchase, which aligns with priorities outlined in Impact 2025 and the Twin Cities Campus Plan, the university and our partners, including members of our community, will identify dining options that, that will create local investment, preserve the historic property for future generations of students, and ensure Dinkytown retains the vibrancy that has served our community so well for so many years. We will be retaining a broker experience in the restaurant industry to assist us in the process and expect that work to start soon after closing on this property. And Madam Chair, uh, I'd like to turn it over now to Assistant Vice President Leslie Kruger uh, to give you more information. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. I'm Acting Chair Doug Hipsch now, so <laughs> Madam Chair, oh. do whatever, do whatever. <laughs> so uh, before we turn to discussion, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Chair Mayor Ron, you've changed, you know, and I and, <laughs> and I also get the pleasure of speaking uh, as a senior associate uh, 
um, Senior Associate General Counsel Greg Brown in a little bit. So I will also uh, change in momentarily as well. So thank you, Acting Chair Hipsch and members of the committee. Today I present to you for review and action the proposed purchase of 325 to 329 14th Avenue Southeast Minneapolis and the establishment of the 325 14th Avenue S Southeast LLC. I will first provide an overview of the property and the proposed transaction, and then I will provi provide you an overview of the limited liability corporation that the administration is proposing to establish to acquire, operate, and maintain the property. The property is situated on the corner of 4th Street Southeast and 14th Avenue. This prominent location in Dinkytown is one block from the university campus and is well positioned to serve the increasing density of student housing in the immediate vicinity as well as the broader community. The property was first developed in 1885 when it was used as a car barn for the Minneapolis Street Railway Company. The current two-story brick structure was built in 1902 and added on in 1923 and contains over 17,000 square feet. It's considered a contributing building to the city of Minneapolis's Dinkytown Historic District. The building has been used for a range of commercial and residential use, uses over the past century. Apartments were, review, were removed prior to 1998, and the building has been entirely commercial since 2000, when it has since served as a restaurant. Earlier this year, President Gable asked Senior Vice President Franz and staff to re-envision the university strategy for Dinkytown by taking a more active role in the area, focusing not only on the programmatic support, but also considering establishing a physical presence. As Senior Vice President Franz noted, this policy shift supports our objective of preserving Dinkytown's ongoing role in the university community. We believe it is important to preserve a balance of the business, entertainment, and residential aspects of Dinkytown that have served our campus community for over a century. Our interest in acquiring this site is so that we can then lease to businesses that preserve the retail opportunities that our university community has long enjoyed. And taking a more active role in Dinkytown is in direct alignment with the Regents' 2014 resolution regarding the university's neighborhood engagement strategy. The regents at the time recognized that the university's quality and brand are inextricably linked with that of the surrounding community. The board expressed support for strategies that advance key interests of both the university and the surrounding community, including creating community amenities that will enrich the livability of the neighborhoods and the surrounding campus. Since that time, we've made significant progress on many of the resolution strategies, and this investment positions the university to continue to advance this effort. This acquisition advances three of the four principles for real estate trans transactions that are articulated in board policy. It aligns with MPAC 25's commitments to enhancing the student <coughs> experience and, and the recently adopted Twin Cities campus plan. But as previously noted, the main objective is to positively impact the areas adjacent to the university. The one principle that we cannot yet state we achieve is the principle regarding providing strategic value when balanced against scarce resources and minimizing financial liability. As noted in the resolution, we are requesting that the university invest up to $3.5 million in the acquisition and initial working capital for the property. We recognize that we may need to sub subsidize the operations of the LLC for some time as we stabilize the building and seek a tenant. Also, given the size of the restaurant facility, there is a risk that we will need to establish a rent structure that does not cover our initial capital investment at the outset. We believe that this financial investment in the property is worth the risk, given the prominence of this location and what establishing the highest and best use for the site means for the entire Dinkytown commercial area, as well as the university. By acquiring this property and ensuring a mix of commercial uses for the community, the university is signaling our ongoing commitment to the success of this area and gives the university the ability to actively drive the future of the area. The total purchase price for the property is $2.8 million, which is consistent with the appraised value. The purchase price includes the building as well as the seller's interest in most of the furniture, fix fixtures, and equipment associated with the restaurant, which previously operated in the building. 
The sale is contingent upon the university completing our due diligence and Board of Regents approval. The purchase and sale agreement allows the university to assign the agreement to a wholly owned entity of the university. The university intends to establish and capitalize a new LLC, the 325 14th Avenue Southeast LLC, to acquire, operate, maintain the property. The university is midway through a 90-day due diligence period, and as stewards of historic properties across the university system, we recognize that acquiring and maintaining such properties come with some risks. For example, this week we're in the process of conducting our phase two environmental site analysis and anticipate we may need to pursue soil vapor mitigation. In addition to the environmental due diligence, we are also conducting a structural analysis as well as facilities condition assessment. Although we recognize we are acquiring a property as is and the purchase price reflects our standard anticipated facilities condition issues that are associated with a 120 year old building, if there are significant issues associated with our due diligence, we will engage the seller in additional conversations regarding the purchase price. In addition to the merits of the real estate transaction, today we are also asking the board for, to consider a resolution that includes three components, which can be found on page 76 of your docket materials. First, the resolution approves the formation by the university of the 325 14th Avenue Southeast LLC the terms of the operating agreement, and the purchases by the University of Equity membership interest in the LLC in a total amount not to exceed $3.5 million. The resolution also approves the purchase of, by the LLC of the property. And finally, the resolution authorizes the university president and the LLC president to execute, deliver, and enter into on behalf of the university and the LLC all agreements necessary to carry out the resolution. This is now part of the part of the presentation that I would have turned over to my colleague, Senior Associate General Counsel, Greg Brown, to provide you an overview of the LLC structure. But unfortunately, Greg is home ill today. And however, he has provi provided me with his prepared remarks. And I will now put on my Greg Brown hat and read those for you. Um, I'll start by, um, I'll skip the part where he said really great and nice things about me and just get, <laughs> get right on to the meat of it. So uh, Chair Mayron, members of the committee, I will be brief. I want to describe for you the formation and a key provision of the proposed operating agreement for 325 14th Avenue Southeast LLC. The administration is closely following a model it used to organize and operate two other single member university controlled real estate LLCs. The model is straightforward enough. 325 14th Avenue Southeast LLC would be formed as a Minnesota limited liability company fully controlled by its sole member, the University of Minnesota. Its authority to transact business would be severely limited in this case to acquiring, operating and maintaining the site. It would have three officers who would be handling day-to-day -day operations, a six-person management committee that would oversee operations, a university administrator, the senior vice president for finance and operations, who would oversee the management committee and provide strategic direction. And this board would oversee, and this board, the Board of Regents, would oversee the LLC, reserving the exclusive authority to approve certain LLC actions. This board approved a similar model with the 2407 University Investment LLC at its October meeting. This board's reserved authorities as set forth in the proposed operating agreement for 325 14th Avenue Southeast LLC perfectly align with those it reviewed and approved at, for the 2407 investment, University Investment LLC in October. I want to emphasize a point, this board is free as it solely decides to reserve particular powers to control and oversee the LLC. The administration is proposing 15 reserved authorities. I won't describe all of them, but some merit highlighting. Under this proposal, the regents would have the sole right to approve the LLC's lending or borrowing more than $10,000, guaranteeing another person's debt, acquiring another company, buying goods or services for more than $1 million, trading securities, buying or selling real estate in any amount, and leasing real property for more than $1 million. There, these are the same reserved powers the administration proposed and this board approved at your last meeting in the operating agreement for the 2407 University Investment LLC. I want to conclude my remarks by discussing some of the benefits of using an LLC structure for this particular transaction. 
The reasoning and OGC's recommendation follows exactly that which justified the university using LLCs to acquire both the Days Hotel at 2407 University Avenue and University Village at 2515 University Avenue. There is material legal and financial benefit to the university by mitigating tort, contract, and environmental liability risk in using a legally separate, single-purpose vehicle to acquire improved property and operate commercial business. And thank you, and this con concludes Senior Associate Vice Pre Senior Associate General Counsel Greg Brown's remarks, <laughs> and mine as well. All right, thank you, and, and just uh, for everyone's uh, information, he is available on Zoom. If there are questions that we want to ask him that uh, Vice President Krieger can't answer for us in his stead, so you'll let us know. All right, um, before we turn to discussion, is there a motion to recommend approval of the resolution related to the purchase of 325 Dash 329 14th Avenue Southeast Minneapolis, an establishment of an investment in the 325 14th Avenue Southeast LLC. I'll move it. A second. Thank you. Any discussion on the resolution? Uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Uh, two questions and then a comment. First, the comment, I think this is a really great idea. Um, I was excited to hear about our thoughts around acquiring property in Dinky Town first in our July 2021 retreat, um, where the President talked to us about that and then seeing this opportunity come to fruition is very exciting. Uh, and I think um, as someone who spent a lot of time in Dinky Town that's lived in Dinky Town, uh, this is in, in you know, now understands the relation of this to uh, the safety and community conversations that I've been having. I think this is a really strong step in the right direction. Um, two questions, and they could be for um, either of our presenters. Um, and I think Senior Vice President Franz touched on this at the beginning, um, but I've, oh, I guess there's three presenters. <laughs> Whoever. Um, is um, the, from a man, so from a, understanding that this would be a dining concept, um, I think I heard that correctly, and if so, um, would this, how, how do, is this kind of a separate exploration than say our, uh, be, then being another retail outlet of our existing food service, um, food service operation, if that makes sense? And then two, uh, question around community engagement. Obviously, I completely understand why we're talking about it. I'm curious if this has been talked about at all in the neighborhood there and what the neighborhood thinks of us doing this. Chair Mayron, Regent yep. Farnsworth. Uh, to your first question, the intention of establishing an LLC is so that we will retain the, we maintain this as a commercial business. We are uh, acquiring all of the FF&E associated or the vast majority of the FF&E associated with the former restaurant operation. So we will have all of that equipment available to us and our goal is to lease the restaurant to a private entity, a, a private restaurant operator so that we can retain a quality sit-down restaurant at, at this prominent corner, uh, rather than have it be an extension of the university. Uh, if we wanted to go that route, we would have uh, had the regents, and the regents could opt to do that, uh, have the regents of the University of Minnesota acquire the property under our, corporate, our constitutional corporation rather than uh, an LLC. Uh, to your second question, in terms of the community engagement, um, we were, uh, uh, deliberate in terms of not wanting to get out in front of the regents in terms of our communication strategy around this. Uh, however, in the last week, our uh, community uh, engage, our um, director of community engagement, Tina Rasmus, has been uh, communicating our uh, goals for acquiring this property with uh, community stakeholders. And uh, her report to me um, as I was sitting here in the Regents meeting and she was wishing me uh, good luck in this presentation was that uh, she has been receiving positive support from the community stakeholders that she's been speaking with. Great, well, I'm all for it, so thanks. All right, thank you. Um, Student Representative Davis. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and thank you as well for presenting on this. As a student, I'm really massively excited about this venture. Uh, I think the un something about the university is there's not uh, enough student-centered spaces, and uh, the old Gray's building used to be a really 
like a place for students to gather and for students to be. And I can tell you sincerely that our student community has felt the loss of that space very deeply. And that having this as a chance for us to go gather and continue with that again is really, really thrilling. Uh, I mentioned it to a friend and had about four people ask me if that meant salsa nights were coming back. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> And what did you tell them? <laughs> I said, I certainly hope so. <laughs> so just a, a fact, I certainly hope that um, the board in, in continuing in the acquisition process of this building, there will be room for student input and for students to kind of really feel like they have the ownership of this space that's been something historical to our community. So thank you for uh, taking their time. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, uh, Chair Mayron, uh, Assistant Vice President Krieger, Senior Associate General Counsel Brown. <laughs> um, so you, uh, I, but my question partly answered, I think, in response to uh, uh, Regent Farnsworth. Um, you mentioned that there are benefits to this structure. I'd like to know kind of what they are, what are the potential downsides in terms of liability and, and, and uh, so on. Um, and also, uh, it, you know, what are the tax implications of an LLC versus being part of our um, um, property ownership? Chair Mayron, Regent Rocha, I'll start the response and I'll let uh, my colleague Greg Brown finish it. I'll start <laughs> with, um, from the LLC perspective, uh, one of the issues, and this was an issue when we were going into the acquisition of 2515 University, University Village, is specifically around some of the environmental uh, considerations. And as we're in the middle of doing that phase two and um, understanding whether or not we will need to install a soil vapor mitigation system, having a separate LLC bracket buckets that any environmental liability uh, from the regents of the University of Minnesota as a constitutional corporation. So I'll let Greg go into a little bit more detail on that. From a tax perspective, uh, even if it were the regents that were acquiring the property and we would be leasing it to a private entity, that private entity would be paying personal property tax uh, as a private entity. So that there really should not be a tax implication associated with that. That would be something that would be uh, associated with the lease that we are uh, intending to um, provide um, as part of the trans, you know, when we actually get a tenant, that that would be passed on, those taxes would be passed on to the tenant. And just a thought, Madam Chair. Sure. So, so in, in, in if we were at some point in time to, let's say, put a UMPD outpost there or use it for our own purposes, would we at that point maybe consider selling it from the LLC to the university if we're, if we would be using the space? And, and then, comma, this, this does not create campus from a um, campus security standpoint. Is that accurate? Chair Mayron, uh, Regent Rocha, that's a really good question. And from a campus, uh, uh, the Cleary Act, I would have to look into that and, uh, and you know, consult with some, some folks as to whether or not the LLC is considered part of campus for the Cleary Act uh, consideration. Uh, in terms of the issues related to um, whether or not we would consider at some point in the future selling it or you know transferring it back to the regents of the University of Minnesota, one of the calculus that we use when we're making a determination as to an, whether to pursue as an LLC versus as the regents is really around that is it a mission a direct mission related. Uh, use. And so if we were proposing to acquire the property and use it for an academic purpose, we would be here today proposing to you to acquire it as the regents. Uh, given that we're proposing to keep this as a commercial business, we're proposing to go the route of an LLC in that respect. If we were to consider at some point in the future going back to some sort of more direct mission related, we may consider that and we would bring that back to the Board of Regents for your review. Thank you. Uh, President Gable, you wanted to weigh in on this question. Just very briefly, I also don't know the Cleary Act answer uh, technically, but I do want to add that part of our interest, there are many, but a cornerstone of our interest is that in ensuring that Dinky Town remains vibrant, uh, that that will positively contribute to our overall efforts around safety in the adjacent neighborhoods. Okay. Um, and, and let me just say, I, and I, Senior Vice President Franz is on the Zoom call as well. Um, 
I raised that issue, I think, when we were doing the preview of this agenda about who would have responsibility for safety uh, at this location, um, given it's not within our, what we think of as um, our campus, uh, whether it would remain under the Minnesota, under the Minneapolis Police Department or just somehow this is gonna fall under our safety requirements. Um, and I think, uh, Senior Vice President Franz, you may have addressed that issue for me when we previewed this or one of the other members on the phone call, but my understanding was that this would not bring it under the umbrella of our safety, uh, our police department directly, but rather it would continue to be under the jurisdiction of the Minneapolis Police Department. And if I'm wrong or remembering that wrong, hopefully someone will correct me. Uh, Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, no, you're exactly right. So clearly this, uh, the Dinky Town area, and even this building, if the LLC owns the building, is clearly within the jurisdiction of Minneapolis, uh, Minneapolis and Minneapolis Police Department. So the, the, the uh, confines of the campus would not change with this. Now, I don't know the technical answer about the Cleary Act. I don't think it would change, but we can, we'll double check that with uh, Chief Clark and uh, Doug Peterson. But the goal here would be that uh, it would be uh, like any other business. So if we uh, come up with a plan to, to lease this to a, a restaurateur, uh, that would be run under the auspices of the city of Minneapolis and the uh, jurisdiction of the Minneapolis Police Department. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, Council Brown, did you wanna weigh in on any of the responses by your colleague or did she do a fine job and I should move on to the next region? I'm a lawyer, so I have to weigh in. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't get paid if I don't. I don't get paid if I don't talk. Uh, thank you, Chair Mehron. I just, uh, if I could, amplify the comments that Associate Vice President Krieger made to Regent Rosha, with respect to the tax question he had. For income tax purposes, the LLC is is considered is actually considered disregarded. It's it's P and L rolls right into the university, so there's no tax paid at the LLC for its activities. All that rolls up to the university. So in that respect, it's 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 neutral to the university using this particular vehicle. Uh, the second uh, amplification is with respect to the a key, at least for the lawyers, reason for doing this as a liability shield. It this vehicle effectively insulates the university from responsibility for claims arising out of the operation of that property to the amount that it is invested in capital in the LLC. So we, we in effect, we put a ceiling on the university's exposure for operating a commercial business. And that's one of the principal reasons OGC has continued to recommend that we use LLCs when, we, when we're having university operate for-profit businesses. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Assistant Council, Senior Assistant Council Brown, much appreciated. Regent Powell. Uh, thank you, Chair Mayor and uh, Associate Vice President. Um, quick, a couple of quick ones starting to overlap. Is there any consideration to uh, within the, the you know the the recommended amount some renovation fund? I mean, it's, <coughs> I've never been in the building. Don't know how old it is. Just do you know anything we could do to enhance the rentability? Uh, I don't know, it's old, but so anyway, just a, just a thought. I'm, pre, you know, playing property manager here. And the other, and, and within that, you know, is there, is, is, there, is there an opportunity for it to be sort of multi-use office space, this, this sort of thing? I understand that restaurant is the core use, but, you know, maybe there are additional revenue opportunities. And then just the last question you mentioned, you know, an environmental review. I mean, do we have any indication that um, some findings are likely or we're, we're just going to, we will obviously we have to go in and have a look. I mean, we, they were storing um, motor vehicles there for a long time. So, uh, but do you have a sense for what will come out of that and will it be manageable? Chair Mayron, uh, Regent Powell, uh, to start with your last question in terms of the environmental um, possibilities there, we are uh, identified as part of our phase one, a couple of different uh, uh, environmental potential issues called RECs. And that's why we are in there this week doing the soil vapor uh, testing. And we do, that That has been an area of focus for the MPCA uh, as of in the last few years. And we encountered that at University Village as well. So we have experience and that's nothing, nothing scary as about as 
uh, put installing a soil vapor mitigation system. It would range in the fifty to sixty thousand dollar range to do that. Uh, in terms of your question related to the uh, facilities condition, yes, we are doing the facilities condition assessment. We are doing a structural assessment as well as a code analysis. The previous owner, um, prior to the to the prop the seller, uh, had removed the second floor and so of the main part of the restaurant, which had how, used to house residential above it. Uh, and so that's a big open space. And it makes for a great space, but it does, we wanted to make sure that it was structurally sound, and it is. Uh, to that effect, though, it does reduce some of the revenue opportunities because we don't have that second floor in that part of the building. We will be looking at all possibilities in terms of whether there are opportunities to break out uh, the other, the addition, um, but that right gets into some code issues in terms of ADA access, where the elevator is, where the bathrooms are and the like. So there'll be some, there may be some opportunities there for parsing out some of the business, some of the parts of the structure, but uh, we'll have to run, we'll address those issues as we get our consultant and to take a look at what are the, the opportunities there in terms of, um, and then from a facilities condition, we are at requesting up to $3.5 million to, ca initial, to capitalize the LLC, which would include the 2.8, approximately $2.8 million for the purchase price, as well as some seed money for some initial, uh, uh, to address some of those facilities condition issues. Uh, we may or may not have to come back to the board to request additional resources. And that is very clear in the resolution that if we do need to acquire additional membership interest in the LLC that we would come back to the board for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, lastly, Regent Kenyanya, and then we'll move on. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just had just compliments uh, for, for, for this initiative. I mean, I think when we spoke about public safety, we did talk about our, our lack of a, you know, a stake, if you will, um, in thinking, of course, we have a huge stake, but um, we talked about being able to enhance that, you know, by doing something like this um, sometime earlier, and that's obviously been a big priority of the board. So just want to thank you, uh, your team, President Gable, and, and everyone for, for this initiative. And I think, I mean, I'd be interested in the clarification around, you know, the Clery notifications and whatnot. But I mean, I think the, the spirit is clear, right? I mean, the principle is clear. We're, we're already committed to that area, and this is just showing that a little more. I mean, I think we're at the end of the Dinkytown, uh, uh, what were we calling it? The, the, the alerts um, pilot and whatnot, and we're, you know, we're gonna take a look at that and keep going. So um, just, just wanted to offer my, my thanks. Thank you. Yep. All right, uh, there being no further discussion, it appears we are ready to vote. All those in favor of the uh, motion to approve the resolution relating to the purchase of 325-329 14th Avenue Southeast, Minneapolis and establishment and investment of the investment in the 325 14th Avenue Southeast LLC, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? The motion is approved. Thank you very much. All right, uh, this now brings us to the revised consent report. Uh, the first item that we are going to consider is amendment to the lease at 150 Broadway Avenue South, Rochester, Minnesota for the Rochester campus separately. And we're going to do that so that Regent Bear Halen can recuse herself from voting on this item. So. Um, before we do that, do, does she need to leave now or can, all right, all right. So the record will reflect that uh, Regent Verhalen is recusing herself. All right, and uh, then uh, Senior Vice President Franz, is there anything you'd like to note about the amendment to, to the lease? I would, and thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Uh, I'm pleased to begin our consent report update with this item from the real estate transaction. In your materials is a lease amendment related to the provision of dining services in the housing facility slated to open on the Rochester campus for the students next fall, 2023. <laughs> in accordance with the lease terms approved by the board in July, the university has determined that the landlord uh, is not able to meet the university's dining program needs as we originally had envisioned. So instead, the university now is proposing to manage the dining services program. This includes 
the leasing and the renovating of the kitchen and the food service spaces, and then contracting with a third party food service provider. Our lease terms are unchanged uh, and the rent for the additional space will be at the current base rate. A related item in this purchase of goods and services of a million dollars and over will be will enable us to enter into an agreement with Chartwells to manage and deliver the dining program in this space. Chartwells is, as you know, the dining provider on the Twin Cities campus, and we've been very pleased with their service on the Twin Cities campus and consider them to be a very important strategic partner with the university. I want to thank all the outstanding staff in the contract administration under the leadership of Amy Karen for their hard work and due diligence in ensuring that our Rochester students will have a first class dining experience in this new facility in 2023 when it opens. And that's all I have to say, uh, Chair Mayron. All right, thank you very much, Senior Vice President Franz. Is there a motion to recommend approval of the uh, amendment to the lease at 150 Broadway Avenue South, Rochester, Minnesota for the Rochester campus? So moved. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion on this motion? Regent Farnsworth. Thanks, Chair Mayron. Really, really quick. I just think this is really significant. Um, a number of us in the 2021 class when we were down in Rochester for onboarding heard very clearly from students about lack of food options. Um, and so uh, this is big um, and it's worth shouting out. And uh, congratulations um, to um, Chancellor Carroll and your team and all the students and everyone who worked on this because um, yeah, it's nice when, when we're able to draw really direct ties to outcomes like that from this table. So thank you. All right. Any further discussion? Yes. Our student representative, Emily Grishbeck. Um, Thank you. I just wanted to uh, add my compliments as well. I'm a Rochester native before I moved up here. And I remember when the UMR campus showed up to Rochester and the first classes of students that showed up there were commenting on you know, the lack of options of food and housing there. And now seeing that these options are showing up, it makes me really excited to like see these things go into action for future students that are showing up to UMR and making use of the good spaces that are there that can continue to foster the relationship between the University of Minnesota, Mayo Clinic, and other entities that are there. So it's just really refreshing to see that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Anything further? All right, then uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Aye. The motion is approved. Uh, then uh, Regent Verhalen can come back uh, if she hears this, hopefully. <laughs> you want to let her know? Okay, here she comes. All right. Uh, at this time, we will now return to the other items in the consent report. Uh, first, I'll note that we are going to consider the conflict management plan separately. Next, I will invite a Senior Vice President Franz to summarize the other items in today's consent report. Then we will have the Twin Cities Director of Athletics, Mark Coyle, speak to the Volleyball Head Coach Employment Agreement. And then we will move to uh, address the remaining items in the consent report. So first, let me start with Senior Vice <clears throat> President uh, Franz. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. The remaining December consent report includes eight purchase of goods and services over $1 million, two leases under the real estate transactions, approval of a memorandum of understanding for the 2026 Special Olympics USA Games, an off-cycle tuition rate change, and five employment agreements. Let me just go through some of these briefly, and then we'll get to the employment agreements. First, on the, on the, purchase, the purchases, the first one is the, from the Compass Group. This is through Chartwell's division, and this is, as I mentioned earlier, this is for the dining services for the University of Minnesota Rochester campus for the period beginning July 1, 2023 through June 30, 2035. The estimated value, total value, is $33.4 million and will be funded by student dining plan changes, charges that will be made beginning in fiscal year 24. Uh, that's the first one. The second one is an agreement with Nike for approximately $5.6 million for the right to pre-purchase up to $16.8 million annually from Nike products at a discounted rate. The agreements grant Nike the designation as exclusive athletic footwear, apparel, and accessory sponsors for the Department of Intercollegiate Athletics 
The period goes from August 1, 2023 through July 20, sorry, July 31, 2027. This contract will be funded from the Department of the Intercollegiate Athletics Annual Operating Budget. Now, in the real estate transaction category, in addition to what we covered earlier uh, on the um, Rochester campus, the, the other two leases, one is the relocation of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery from one lease space to another in the Twin Cities West Bank campus. The proposed lease includes funds for improvements in the new space. The other lease is due to relocating some classroom space on the Rochester campus from one Discovery Square to two Discovery Square at the request of the landlord. The landlord will bear the cost of this leasehold improvement to provide similar space in the new locations. Now for the Memorandum of Understanding for Special Olympics. With respect to the Special Olympics, the university will, host, will be the host institution for those games in June 2026. The Memorandum of Understanding defines between the university and Special Olympics USA Games 2026, there are supplemental agreements we expect to sign for a variety of activities, including things like the, an operations center, housing, food service, and venue rental. And as we all know, President Gable is an honorary co-chair for the 2026 Games. So that memorandum is in the consent report. The next item I want to mention is the off-cycle tuition rate changes. Now, for our standard practice of submitting off-cycle tuition adjustments proposals in December for programs with academic years starting in the summer term, this year, there are just two master's level programs in the Carlson School that are included for your approval. First, and now these are both full-time programs. The first one is the Master of Science in Business Analytics, or the MSBA, and the Master of Science in Finance, or the MSFIN, MSFIN. And both programs have strong demand. The proposed 3% tuition rate increase would keep them competitive with peers and would not impact existing students as they are just one year post baccalaureate programs. And now finally for the employment agreement category, in our employment agreements, we have the following for your consideration. First, Jamie Darren Prinkert as the next Dean of the Carlson School of Management effective July 3, 2023. Uh, next is PJ Fleck, head coach football for Gopher Athletics seeks to extend Coach Flex contract by one year through December 31, 2029. Last December, the board approved a one-year extension for Coach Fleck. Those contract terms will, will remain the same except for increasing the annual salary from $5 million to $6 million, adding $1 million to the assistant's salary, uh, assistant coach salary pool, adding $50,000 bonus for each Big Ten win above a 500 winning percentage in conference play only, and making some incentive adjustments. Now, part of Coach Flex extension includes increases for his coaching staff. Two of those agreements also require board approval. First, for Joe Rossi, the defensive coordinator for football, Go for Athletics seeks to replace Rossi's current contract with a new three-year agreement extending his contract through January 31, 2026. This agreement includes a base salary of $1.1 million a year with a $50,000 escalator each season. The next one is for uh, Coach Kurt Soraka. He's the football offensive coordinator. Gopher Athletics seeks approval for a three-year agreement with a salary of $625,000 a year through March 22, 2023, followed by an increase to $900,000 for the remainder of year one and a $50,000 it's later each season. The final contract we have for your agreement is for Coach uh, Keegan Cook as the head volleyball coach. I'll invite uh, Athletic Director Mark Coyle to the to the testifier table to talk about this. I would say, as he is approaching the table, Madam Chair, that I do want to give a, a real a thank you to the Athletic Department, the Office of General Counsel, my Office of Senior Vice President, and the Board Office for all the hard work they did to get this contract ready and presented to the board today. And the spirit of our all of our hard work was to make sure that we support our student athletes. And with that, I'll turn it over to Athletic Director Mark Coyle. All right, Athletic Director Coyle. 
Yeah, Chair Mayron and, and members of the board, thank you. And, and I want to echo uh, uh, Myron's comments. We're very appreciative of you taking time to uh, to let us get this contract to you as quickly as possible. Obviously, uh, we're excited that we hired Keegan Cook. Uh, I want to thank President Gable. She spent time uh, interviewing our final candidates, and that sends a strong, strong message when we bring in candidates. And, and Coach Cook uh, has spent the last eight years as the head coach at the University of Washington. Each year, he led that program to the NCAA tournament. Uh, they had four, uh, I think, elite eight appearances, one final four appearance. So he's an incredibly successful coach and uh, he received rave reviews from the coaches and student athletes that we talked to. And we uh, have agreed to, pending your approval, a five-year agreement with Coach Cook, uh, an annual salary of $425,000 a year. Uh, and if we were to terminate him without cost, 50% of that contract is guaranteed. In turn, if he'd left us in the first two years, he would have to pay the full amount of the remaining base salary, and then it, it, it de-escalates down in the outer years of the contract. But again, when we look at the Big Ten and, and look at the market across the country, we feel these are very favorable terms for the university. Thank you, Chairman. All right, thank you. Thanks uh, to both of you. Is there anyone that would like to either ask a question, make a comment, or separate out any other items from the report to be voted on separately before I invite a motion to recommend approval of the remaining items on the consent report? And just to remind everyone that you can ask a question, you can make a comment if you would like without calling out a particular item for a separate vote, or you can call out a particular item for a separate vote if you would like to do so. So, all right. Uh, oh, Look, yes, uh, Regent Rocha. Madam Chair, you're, you're waiting for a motion before we have the conversation, or, or are you wanting the, co the comments now before? I need to know if we would hear comments now, uh, or if you had questions now, or if you want to separate <laughs> out an item for a separate motion, I would need to know that now as okay. well. Just thank you, Madam Chair. Just to be, uh, I'm interested in making comments on a couple things. I don't think they need to be separated. So I didn't. Then, then we would take the comments now, correct? Did, did, didn't want to miss the bus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, why don't we have you make comments now and, uh, on any item? I'm not hearing that anybody wants to separate out any of these remaining items. As I indicated, we will address the conflict management plan separately. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have three. Um, and I'll three comments. Yes, okay. and I'll go from shortest to longest. Um, thank you, um, and uh, thank you, uh, Director Coyle. Um, on the master's uh, tuition increase, um, as as I think most of you know, I hesitant to increase tuition. Uh, I, I'm less concerned when we get to the graduate level. Um, I'm particularly uh, concerned about um, making sure the baccalaureate uh, opportunity is available for folks. Uh, so I don't have an issue with that. Um, uh, that increase under these circumstances based on what was told today. Uh, next, I'll, I'll address the, the volleyball coach um, uh, proposition. I think it looks like a very strong um, hire. I um, was you know, impressed with uh, what little, uh, I mean, what I was able to find in a little bit of background research and what was provided to us. I think that, um, I think that uh, Coach uh, Keegan. Coach Keegan Cook, yes, Cook. sir. Yes, Cook. Um, is um, we should, I think, continue on the, a very successful program, very popular program, um, a very popular program with my 13-year-old libero. Um, and so uh, uh, I think it's a step in the right direction. I was, I was pleased that financially it's a respectable compensation rate, but it's, it's, it's reasonable. Uh, Nebraska obviously sets the pace <laughs> pretty dramatically in that regard. Um, you know, I, I, there was an article recently talking about volleyball, and I'm, you know, the, we have a wonderful arena. Uh, we have a strong fan base, and boy, if we could, you know, move ourselves into a revenue sport, that would be really exciting. I, I, I did notice that we've got pretty strong expenses. I was kind of surprised, based on the size of the, of the program and, and uh, the fact that you don't have an ice sheet or other things to maintain that, that they're, they're that high. So I'd be very interested going forward if we can, if there are things we can do, investments we can make to move that into that realm. Um, but I, I'm also kind of interested in, uh, in this is you know kind of my one shot for the conversation. But um, you know when we talk about uh, we, we we watch 
volleyball and other sports we watch, men's hockey, women's hockey, uh, men's basketball, women's basketball. How does volleyball, how is, and the reason I bring this up is because it's a lot of money. I mean, that, that, that compensation is a lot uh, for a non-revenue sport, at least non-revenue as of right now. Um, does, does volleyball get credit for the, the television revenue that we get, uh, whether it's uh, you know, with, with uh, I guess now it's uh, Valleys? Um, how, how, does, how does that program, because it does have a, a lot of visibility in, in recent years and very exciting to see that, how do they get credit for that as, as a way of sort of, a, you know, kind of justifying our, our strong investment in, in top talent? Uh, Chair Mayron and, and Regent Roche, if I understand your question correctly, so, so obviously um, our media partners uh, in the Big Ten Conference, as you know, um, we're in the final year of our current media rights agreement, and we have a new deal that will start next year with some new media partners. Uh, but those media partners ranging from ABC, ESPN, which will now turn into CBS, uh, Fox, Big Ten Network, et cetera, um, about 90% of those deals are tied in with football. Uh, and, and the exposure of football. But when you talk to um, the Big Ten Network folks, they will tell you that volleyball, the viewership for volleyball is very, very high. And if you've noticed, and I'm sure your 13-year-old your libero has noticed, mm -hmm. that there's more volleyball on Big Ten Network at night. Um, and they've done a really good job. I give Francois McKillicuddy, the president of the Big Ten Network, a lot of credit, uh, and, and our, our president and other leaders in the Big Ten Conference, because they've, they've structured now where you might have Minnesota volleyball playing, which will lead into a Minnesota wrestling match. And they try to pair up different sports with different programs on the same night. So volleyball does generate uh, and does have TV excitement. It has strong TV viewership on the Big Ten Network. Uh, it's hard to quantify exactly what that number is, but, but a lot of those numbers are tied to, to obviously the, the football, the men's basketball television, that's what the media partners uh, with the viewership numbers. But volleyball has great, great ratings on those networks as well. Thank you. Madam Chair, may I? Close out here. Sure. Thank you. And uh, those television broadcasts should come with a an incomplete homework uh, warning on them as well on those school nights, right? Um, so I want to I want to talk about um, uh, the we we got uh, Coach Fleck up and 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 uh, my opportunity to to speak to this. I've you know I've had. I've had season football tickets to uh, go for football since I was a senior in high school when they were first offered to incoming freshmen, and I've had them ever since. And uh, I know it, uh, that's not always common on the Board of Regents and other institutions you would see that it's you know, particularly more common and, and where the, the entire state you know, sort of lives and dies on, uh, with, the, with the program. And so this is, these are important things. And um, as, as I was analyzing the, the proposal that's, that's put in front of us, and I appreciate the data that your, your uh, department provided, um, you know, just a couple weeks ago we watched um, the Gophers beat Wisconsin, uh, winning the axe on what's named Barry Alvarez Field. And I note that um, Coach Alvarez would have loved to have had Coach Fleck's record in his first six years, that Coach Fleck has actually outpaced Barry Alvarez and wins in, in his uh, first half dozen years as the coach uh, of, of the Gophers. Um, now, w w as we talk about these salaries, it was you know, unfortunate last year when we were talking about it, administrative uh, compensation. There's there's really no comparison uh, uh, between the two as far as um, when we look at football as a, a, it's a revenue generating activity, uh, which is separate from the operation of the institution as a whole. Um, it's not a, the, I, don't, I don't perceive the, fo the football coach as a public service. It's a, uh, um, the salary includes no tuition or state dollars. The football program, uh, as a successful program, generates over $30 million. I believe it's uh, in the last year about $32 million over its expenses, which goes on to fund um, other programs. And, uh, and I, I expect that will likely go up with the uh, new television deal and with the expansion of the conference now essentially coast to coast. Um, and then I also note that the loss of a successful football coach can cost tens of millions of dollars as you have to restart uh, the program, you know, potentially leading to a more of a subsidy coming from other sources at the university to cover the non-revenue sports. Now, the, the problem uh, is that um, you know, we, we have to kind of figure out what we're doing with our football program. And, and I know this is a challenge that you inherited when you took, took over your position um, because to, to a large extent, we, we give our football coach an almost impossible job at Minnesota because, uh, you know, we've done an amazing job providing Athletes Village and better facilities as a recruitment value. Certainly your relationship, uh, President Gable's relationship with the program, I think has been a, a great advantage. But we haven't done a whole lot on campus to, 
to improve the experience uh, for uh, football fans. Um, our East Gateway project, I, I don't, I haven't so far seen anything that really focuses to assist us in our athletics offerings. Uh, it doesn't add dormitories, in which we're last in the conference, uh, in providing to our students on a per student basis. And, and we don't, it doesn't add any new uh, open space uh, for a, a hospitable environment for a better game day experience. And having just come back from Madison, there's a, it's a, it's a very different feel uh, when you're there. And so, I mean, anybody that's attended a football game in Iowa, Nebraska, Wisconsin, Michigan, or Ohio State, uh, just to name a handful, they know what that atmosphere uh, is, is like. And then when you think about the job that Coach Fleck has to do, you imagine a coach bringing a, a recruit into a stadium with 80, 90, or 100,000 uh, fanatics. Um, but the difference is we have, a, we, we have an issue there. We have a challenge there. And um, you know we have a you know 51,000 seat stadium with you know oftentimes around 40,000 fans, and so that's you know to, to a large extent I think that we're we're um, asking him to run that recruiting race with, uh, with with quite a handicap in that respect. So you know he came into the program with a good start uh, the first season uh, the previous season uh, the cupboard was not bare I should say when he came when he came in and he's done very well. Um, his players have been good citizens. They've done well academically. And on the you know on the field success is is the, is the real measure, um, but you know last and this this is a conversation that you have in public is you don't have to have a football team to be a successful university, as the University of Chicago showed when they left the Big Ten about a century ago, but if we if we didn't have one we'd have to come up with about thirty plus million dollars to fund these other activities, and so I you know my my feeling is in, in my closing comments on this is that. You know, if we're going to have one, I think we should commit to being excellent. And Coach Fleck has led the Gophers to being relevant again. I'm happy to hear people complaining on talk radio or on news uh, sports radio because uh, I went through a large part of my academic career where people just didn't bother talking about it because it just wasn't relevant. So I'm very pleased with what you've been able to do and with what Coach Fleck has been able to do. And so I, I, I support this contract despite uh, the fact that, you know, to Many people in Minnesota, this is monopoly money. It's hard to imagine a six million dollar uh, annual salary, and and so that what I would just simply say is I challenge this this board and, and the administration to 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 make the investments necessary to improve the game day experience, to bring fans back on campus, and to help these coaches that are in this in, in this uh, <clears throat> consent agenda uh, to to be able to bring in the players to succeed at recruiting and then and then sub subsequently on field success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regent Rocha. Any, uh, yes, uh, Regent Sweden. Madam Chair, I'll be very, very quick. Great. And, and Mark, I, I thank you for what you've done in bringing these folks to Minnesota and before us uh, with a successful program. Just a quick, very, very small comment, but very, very important, I think, to our student athlete experience. Performance goals, I believe, are very, very important. And you have performance goals and coaches' salary. But importantly, and I think important to all of us, you have a, a not as large a dollar amount, but you recognize graduation rates and the academic performance of the students are very, very important to us and to the whole program. And thank you, not the dollar amount the same as winning the Big Ten or going to the Rose Bowl, I understand those are important, but just the recognition of the students and their academic performance is important. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? All right, is there a motion to recommend approval of the remaining items on the consent report? Moved. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? <coughs> All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, aye. please say no. The motion is approved. The next item that we will vote on separately is the conflict management plan. First, what I would like to do is uh, ask for a motion to uh, recommend approval of the conflict management plan. I'll move it. Is there a second? Thank you. Now that that item is before us, I would like to offer an amendment to modify two sections of the conflict management plan as shown on the document that was sent out to you, I believe yesterday, it was also placed at your seat today, is that correct? Okay. And uh, it, so I hope everybody ha has it in front of them and uh, has had an opportunity to review it. At this time, I would move to amend the conflict management plan as shown uh, by my proposed amendment. I'll second it. Thank you very much. 
Uh, let me just explain why the purpose of this amendment, um, and that is, uh, first of all, I support the conflict management plan uh, and support uh, President Gable's desire to serve on uh, the Securian board. Um, but my uh, desire for having this amendment was to make sure that it was very clear to us as regents, to President Gable, to Securian, that by adopting this conflict management plan and the amendment, what we're really saying is that she is walled off from any activities at Securian as a board member having to do with the university. And conversely, that uh, Securian understand and that um, she's walled off, and she understands here as president that she is walled off from any discussions or involvement that the university may have with Securian. So it's really reflecting that there is a wall around her and her activities with Securian and making sure that everyone knows that she will not have any involvement on those activities, nor will Securian ask her to be involved uh, in any of those activities. And the second uh, amendment, uh, or the paragraph five, where she is required to provide them with a copy of the conflict management plan including this amendment is, is basically to ensure that both sides to the equation understand that uh, the extent of her recusal on any Securian slash university activities. And I felt it necessary to make sure that that was in writing. I know that President Gable has provided those insur assurances both to the conflict committee that uh, reviewed it uh, and to is let Securian know, but I thought it was important that we put it in writing as regents. And that's the basis for my um, motion uh, for the amendment. Um, <clears throat> I, I think what we do, so first of all, we would take discussion on the amendment uh, and a vote on the amendment, and then we would take a, a vote on the main um, motion. So any discussion on the amendment? All right, uh, hearing uh, none, then all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 All those aye. opposed, please say no. The amendment is approved. Now we'll move to the um, conflict management plan. Is there any further discussion on the conflict management plan as amended? All right, there being no further, oh. Sorry, is there a discussion? Yes. Oh, all right. Uh, sorry, Regent Rosha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's a challenging topic. Um, just learned about it a couple of days ago. Um, I've got a, got a couple of questions, and then, and then depending on the answers, I've got uh, a couple of comments. Um, in putting together the, the conflict resolution plan, um, who were the members of, the, of that panel? I don't think that was provided to us. And if it was, I missed it. Okay. That's a point. Kumar. All right. Uh, coming to the podium is, I believe, the chair of that committee, Boyd Cooper. Coomer, is that, am I saying it correctly? Um, Probably not. Oh, Coomer, yes, yes. Coomer. Thank, thank right. you. Thank you, Chair Mayron. And do you uh, want to identify your role then on the yeah. committee? All right, thank yeah, you. Ab ab absolutely. And uh, members of the committee. So I'm the university's chief compliance officer, and I manage the Office of Institutional Compliance that manages the Conflict of Interest Program. So the chair of the um, conflict review panel is Art Erdman, who is a longtime faculty member um, in engineering. And so the other members of that committee, voting members of that committee, include uh, Paul Olin, who's in dentistry, uh, Jeffrey Radcliffe, <coughs> excuse me, Ratliff Crane uh, from psychology, uh, Michael Volna from finance, uh, Quinn uh, Galswick from internal audit, um, myself, but I recuse myself in this matter because I report directly to President Gable. And then Patricia Simmons is our community member representative and that's former Regent Simmons. Madam Chair, so just to confirm, so um, Regent Emeritus Simmons and uh, Auditor Galswick who reports directly to the, to the board, the, the other folks, including yourself, although, you know, you're a direct report, the others are all within the organization under the president. Is that accurate? As faculty members, they're 
they are all faculty members at the organization and uh, one person in finance. And, uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, um, so and, and how much, uh, it was provided that this is over 10,000, which is what triggered the con consideration. How much is the compensation being proposed? President Gable, do you want to address that? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, <clears throat> Regent Rocha, the, my understanding is the annual compensation is $130,000 a year. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this, I mean, Madam Chair, if I may, yes. the, uh, this, is, this is tough. Like I said, I wasn't, wasn't expecting this. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, as, as trustees, it's, it's a challenging job, uh, especially because we do almost everything in public. You know, if a, a, a private conversation or a call from the chair or something, I would have been able to have a fulsome discussion without, you know, feeling like I'm touching uh, nerves that I would rather not have to touch. But, um, you know, understanding that there are five schools that were reported as having similar situations where the president is, is um, serving on a, on a for-profit board, I, I went and looked at them fairly, you know, uh, quickly. Um, in Nebraska, Terra Wolf, Inc., um, that's a carbon-free energy source uh, company that's located in Maryland, a long way from Nebraska, doesn't have any, any uh, business relationship with, with the university. Uh, Ohio State, the, the president is a member of the Cisco board, and Cisco does business with Ohio State, but I note that um, she had been on that board for eight years, so they knew that when they hired her that she was a member of, of that board. Um, Penn State, it's Lancaster Colony Corporation. Uh, they make croutons and other uh, food snacks and so on, and, and that was also a case where the um, president was on the board prior to being hired uh, at Penn State. And Purdue, uh, Cerner Corporation, uh, Northern, uh, Norfolk Southern Corporation, that's railroads a long way away from the school, so there's not a direct uh, financial relationship. Rutgers, there's this turn it in, and I can't confirm that their president's actually on that board. I'm not saying that, that he's not, but um, I wasn't able to conf find anything that showed that he was the director there. Um, you know, our job as, as, as trustees, as regents, is tough because we sometimes have to um, take positions on behalf of the institution uh, that are not necessarily popular among the, the people that are um, working with us on the administrative side. Um, but this appears to be a, a step back for the university. Our job is to always act in the best interest of the University of Minnesota. Um, certainly somebody might be able to, I, I've been trying to craft an argument as to how creating a limitation that doesn't presently exist actually helps the University of Minnesota. We don't have these limitations now. Under the administrative policy, it says, you know, the president, as an employee of the university, may not participate in outside activities that interfere with regular employment. But part of the, the conflict resolution plan states that the president will recuse herself from any decisions on behalf of securing financial that involve the university. And, you know, we, we already have a contract that's multi-million, you know, multi-millions of dollars per year. Well, that's part of the president's job is to oversee really everything below the president. And, and, and being able to have an opinion about securing contract issues, if we had a problem with the pension funds, I would want our CEO to be able to engage these issues. We presently have that ability. Our president does not have a conflict right now. If she accepts this position, she now has a conflict which would interfere, I believe, with the regular employment of the president. Under the contract, it says the president shall not engage in any activity that may be competitive with or adverse to the interests of the university. Well, this takes another step, but as you look at our ability to pursue relationships with financial services companies, this creates a bit of a challenge. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, I already men mentioned that the, I the ICOI panel, including five people, you know, that that report to the president found, quote, there is no way to eliminate all perception of influence, unquote, from this appointment. There, there's no way to eliminate all perception of influence. We don't currently have a perception of influence when interacting with Securian. That is not in the university's best interest. And if you're a trustee with the, the duty of honesty and loyalty and good faith with the interest of the beneficiary, the University of Minnesota, you would not go out and say, I'd like to create this 
this perception of improper uh, perception of influence. Now, and, and again, this is not a, a distant hypothetical. This is an energy, uh, like, well, like the energy company on the other side of the, of the country. This is a company that has billion, a billion, over a billion dollars in relationships with the university already and millions per year. Now, it, it states that the, the president um, informed the Office of Institutional Compliance um, that she will not, uh, does not, will not take actions on behalf of the university that could be perceived to benefit Securian. Those are actions that she presently can take that as long as it's in the best interest of the university, but once this is in place, now that's, that's a limitation. Um, so the challenge here is this either creates an undeniable bias in favor of Securian or it eliminates our potential of having Securian as a partner in key financial services. We don't have those problems right now and adding them violates a region's duty as uh, advancing the interests of the institution. Um, now recommendations to the Board of Regents will show that the president is recused. This is not required now, and this is not a positive. This is a negative impact on the operations of the university. And finally, I'll just say the relationship here it creates a chilling effect. Um, the, sub, you know, the, sub, the subjective result is that despite a recusal, there will remain a chilling effect uh, from the relationship uh, that will be created among others. We had a, we had a construction deal uh, a number of years back where one of the, um, the people, one of the entities that was presenting a proposal uh, employed the, the son of the president. The president recused, although the decision was made by somebody who reports to the president, which in ethics world doesn't clear the, the conflict. Um, but I, I later heard from other members of the trades that they did not bother applying to the university because they perceived that it was already a done deal because the president's son was a part of that company, that is not in the university's best interest, to have a limitation on the number of people that are applying or, or putting forward proposals to serve the university. And so on that basis, you know, there are more relationships. There's even rela issues with relationships with people on the board um, involved with the Big Ten and, and how we as an institution interact in that respect that are affected by these um, uh, uh, transfers of, of, uh, of, of payment and, uh, and a creation of a new fiduciary duty. This creates a fiduciary duty that, com com that impacts the fiduciary duty that the, the, p the position of president of the university has to the University of Minnesota. And from that standpoint, I don't believe any member of this board can, can vote in favor of this. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I for different reasons, um, some similar, some different. You know, I, I was of a similar opinion. I, I actually don't generally have an issue with this kind of engagement, um, whether it's a local company or, or a company um, across the country. Um, and and I, you know, I mean, there's the argument of benefit to the university that, that which may be there, um, but I still think it's within the president's right you know, as a citizen, you know, whether she's spending her private time in this, enter the proposed enterprise or some other hobby or whatever, I mean, that that's her time as long as it's within that policy. And I think it actually can be beneficial to be in such uh, settings, you know, especially with regards to exposure to uh, a donor base and, you know, um, not necessarily just the organization, but the other members on, on the board and such relationships and whatnot. Um, I was just really hung up on that current relationship we have with Securian, uh, it's not an insignificant one. Um, if you ask me, I, I know some of it was dwindling and, and there's some of those things that um, cannot be renewed, but I, they are still active. It's not an issue now, um, as in there's no, I don't wanna use the word conflict right away, but it's not an issue until it is, you know? I mean, I think um, things go well until they don't and, um, you know, um, see that if you're in the litigation review committee or some of the other things we get, I mean, partners are partners until there's an issue. And I feel like for uh, a function this important employee retirement to kind of put ourselves in a situation where if, if some, something did happen and, and our chief executive can engage, um, you know, or address that issue, you, you know, or anything like that. So I, I don't have a lot of the listed concerns and, um, you know, if it wasn't an organization with a $1.5 billion interest that the university has, I, I think it would be okay. But I, 
um, I get hung up on, on that part. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Regent Kenyanya. Regent Powell? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Mayron. You know, first of all, just I, I do support uh, uh, this uh, opportunity for the president to join the Security and Board. Um, and I really do think that it's um, a very good kind of developmental idea and opportunity for um, university presidents who are in that chief executive role. I think it's really good for them to be on one uh, board because they, it puts them sort of, you know, on the other side of the horseshoe. And I think it'll make seeing, you know, uh, how it looks from our, our vantage point. And I think that um, the experience will actually make her a better president just from watching, you know, the executive function at another organization. So I think it's really positive um, to be on one. Uh, and in terms of the conflict management, as, a, as I look at it, there are two. There's the, there's the retirement plan relationship, which is going to go away because it already has security and has sold that business to Fidelity. So that one goes away. And then there's the insurance uh, relationship. Insurance is, uh, is a very deep, um, uh, uh, it's kind of a request for proposal kind of business. It's a very deep market, so we'll get a lot of bids. And I think the remedy for anything like that is for the, you know, the person to recuse themselves. I mean, that's, that's how conflicts are managed. And so I think that the recusal plan here is you know, very appropriate. It's what's done. I mean, it's sort of normal. And um, I, so I'm, I don't really, um, I think this is how these are managed. And, and uh, Regent Rocha mentioned, uh, you, know, so, you know, several other companies. And I've been on it, several boards. Every single one of them had a university person on them of one sort or another because they bring talent and expertise. And so it's very common. And I think that the conflict that we have here is easily uh, managed through the, through the proposal. So I'm very supportive. and. Uh, and I think that this is uh, it's this been a thorough kind of conflict management process. It's been reviewed, and I think that this is we have a good remedy here. Thank you, uh, Regent Powell. Uh, Regent Verhalen. Thank you. Um, I I echo a lot of um, Regent Powell's comments, and to to take on one of the comments um, that Regent Kinyanya made that it's it's not a conflict until it is. That's the position we all sit in here on this board. Um, as demonstrated a few minutes ago, I had to recuse myself from a matter because a conflict arose that I didn't foresee being a conflict until it occurred in front of us. And we have a policy. And the interesting thing is we as regents are expected to self-disclose those conflicts as they arise. We don't have a conflict management plan. We don't have a detailed set of requirements in front of us. We don't even have the ability within each other to force someone to quit what they're doing if it creates a conflict. Whereas in this position that the, the president is coming to us to ask if she can take consistent with her employment contract, we as regents can withdraw that approval if we see it creating an issue. And that gives us a really big enforcement tool as we work through this and we have a staff and a board and a committee that's on top of this, including requiring reporting first at 90 days and then on an annual basis, and they can change that reporting requirement or request at any point in time, including asking for specific documentation as things go along, specific correspondence, specific information she was provided, how the president declared her recusal from certain items, how Securian responded, et cetera. And so there's a lot of opportunities for oversight. And if at some point in time we feel like it's not sufficient or we feel it's pulling her away from her activities here or it's inserting itself into her administrative duties which are not overseeing an RFP um, of the type seen here, then we can revisit it and we can require her to resign her position on the board. Um, the other item I would, I looked into the other presidents as well and yes, the president of Ohio State was already seated on the Cisco board when she became president. Um, given her experience as an engineer and, and her areas of expertise, it is something that the board likely evaluated and decided they weren't going to ask her to resign. I will note that not only do they do business, this year Cisco announced they were entering into this huge new research partnership with Ohio State University. And so there are ways to work through these. As a lawyer, we work through the conflicts frequently within the law firm, as between clients, as between lawyers, as between practice areas. And it is a developed practice that is out there. And I have 
faith, I guess, would be the term in our constitute or <laughs> our compliance, our institutional compliance. I was going to make you the constitutional <laughs> compliance group, but that is not correct. <laughs> our institutional compliance office in evaluating the situation and setting out guardrails for purposes of our evaluation. And if it begins to go astray, we can terminate it. Those are my comments. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Thank you very much, Regent uh, Verhalen. Uh, Regent Sviggum. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, um, very tough, as you said, <coughs> Regent Rocha. And when we had a chance, when you called me yesterday, I was <clears throat> working on that elliptical machine and almost dying, <laughs> as we remember it was, as we were talking earlier. this. I thought you were just amazed by my argument and breathing <laughs> well, heavy. I was amazed because I was sensitive to them. And I think the arguments you make are very reasonable. I think that they're respectful. Uh, and I don't think you or anybody else here should feel uh, um, wrong or picked on for bringing them up. Uh, in fact, I, I almost wish the Curian had asked me to be on their board of directors. But I realize that uh, Joan Gable has a lot more to offer than I do. I recognize that. Um, so today, Darren, I had a chance just to talk to a few folks about this situation and how it might be handled differently or if it's appropriate. Um, uh, first of all, I, I, I said, would it, if they, if Securing had asked anybody else in the community at the university to be on their board, would they be treated differently? And the answer was no, whether it be uh, uh, the, the provost or whether it be the HR director or whatever, had they been asked, we would be handling it the same. And no special treatment for the president. Um, in fact, I almost think I almost think I should be happy for the president uh, getting involved within the community more, ingraining herself within the uh, Minneapolis or the Minnesota community might be good for us. It, it, it might be really good for us from a, a perception standpoint. Uh, and then I went further and asked people who have knowledge more than I, um, you know, what type of communication, what type of role does the president have with securing right now? And the answer was none. I, I don't even know if you know who the securing president was. I don't even know that. But uh, it's hard to hold someone, I think, uh, uh, it, it's hard to hold someone uh, who probably has no role or no communication in the past to a future standard of public perception that, that doesn't exist even now. I, I think that's unfair to the person. Uh, and that's why we also have the conflict management plan uh, that is being presented. Um, your arguments, to, your discussion to me yesterday was, was appropriate, it was sensitive. I, I agreed with some of the points. But as I, I look further, folks, I don't see this as being a negative conflict potential for us at all. I, I think it might only be positive for the university, uh, for, for us. And, and so, uh, while I didn't commit to you anyway yesterday, I didn't commit to you anyway, uh, I'm going to support it because I, I think this ultimately could be good for the university, good for our president, and, and certainly within the conflict management that you brought forward, Madam Chair, as well as before, uh, I think the risk of public perception ought not be there for something that doesn't even exist now that won't exist in the future. That, that's unfair to her. I'm, yeah. I'm done. Thank you, yeah. Regent Stigham. Uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Marion. I have a quick question. It's probably an obvious answerable question by our policy guru up there. Uh, and it's related to our policy and how I'm looking at this, one of the um, considerations. Our policy allows for this type of conflict management plan that then therefore allows someone to operate within policy um, in this circumstance. Is, is that a yes? Jason. Let me try to address this and then Jason, you can try Just to. Yes or no. <laughs> yeah. I think the answer is yes. I mean, the whole point of having a conflict management policy is it acknowledges conflicts can arise and can, but that you can create an opportunity to manage them if you can do that. And so if we didn't, 
if we wanted to have a policy that said anytime there's a conflict, uh, you can't do it. We don't need a conflict management policy and we don't need a committee to examine is it something that can be managed uh, together. So I, I think that the answer is by having this policy, it assumes conflicts may arise and they can be, there is a process by which they can be managed or rejected. So the answer is yes. Thank you. That, that would be my answer. <laughs> what do you think, Jason? <laughs> Chair Mayor on Regent Davenport, yes, your, your board policy on uh, institutional conflict of interest designs a process in which to be able to manage. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, uh, Chair Mayron, and thanks to everyone for the discussion. And I think just given the given the conversation of the matter, if I could ask for a roll call um, vote on this, just to be clear about it um, when we get to that point. I think um, for me, you know, this wasn't thinking about even this broader topic wasn't even on my radar. You know, when I started this week, um, and then when we got it, uh, learning about what the Institutional Conflict Review Panel is, um, thinking about all these different considerations, uh, looking at what other as other colleagues have spoke about, looking at what other institutions do, um, amongst the other correspondence we were getting and other issues in preparation on a board um, meeting week, it's been a lot um, of, of trying to figure out this from a policy standpoint, and I think uh, just from this conversation today, but from other considerations, perhaps in governance, pol governance and policy or another venue that it invites some future um, conversation and consideration on the broader topic, not um, this specific um, vote and so um, I think where I'm really approaching this from and where I try to approach everything from is from an institutional lens um, as a trustee of this university with the sole duty to the University of Minnesota and so um, I again um, I you normally don't go this down in the order so it's been interesting to listen to other people's um, uh, arguments and points and I appreciate that and uh, it's just I'm not quite there yet to be able to support this um, from a comfort level. Um, I wish we would have been able to have some dialogue about this earlier. I think that would have been helpful to know about this earlier and to be able to uh, think through some of this, but um, just from an institutional lens, from not wanting to, not being comfortable at this point supporting um, the creation of this arrangement um, with that creates another fiduciary duty with a with a um, organization or business that does business with the university. Um, I'm unfortunately not able to support it today, but hope we can um, have future conversations as a as a policy board around um, what future situations like this may look like. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Regent Farnsworth. Uh, Regent Talrabi. Um, thank thank you, Chair Mayron, and. Um, I, I just wanted to um, say that um, I think the conversation has been really robust and I'm really appreciating, but also um, considering the policy and listening to the conversations, actually what it helps um, to uh, define for me is a great confidence in actually how, uh, how, how things are supposed to work. I think that, you know, uh, oftentimes, uh, when you have uh, really smart people, and, and I tend to think that we do have a lot of those people at the university, that they their wisdom and knowledge and expertise will be tapped in lots of different ways. And when we think about these types of things, we often tend to think about the conflict side, but I would agree with my uh, uh, fellow regents about uh, the, the, the good and the benefits to the university to have more uh, engagement in other ways, this included. And uh, I find that actually what has been laid out uh, creates transparency. I think conflict, uh, when there's potential conflict and when that is made transparent, it gives us confidence to know that things are supposed to, they work a certain way and we identify those things. So uh, for that reason, I am going to support this. Um, Thank you, Regent Talrabi. That. Uh, Regent Tad Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to uh, associate myself with the comments of, of Regent Verhalen um, in that lawyers are trained to uh, on how to create a wall when there's a conflict and uh, to uh, 
separate themselves out. Um, the president is a seasoned attorney and also an expert in business law. And also, uh, Regent Sviggum mentioned that this is an opportunity to get engaged with uh, businesses in the state of Minnesota, and I actually see that as positive. So I would vote for this. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Johnson. I, I, Regent Rocha wants to speak, but I wanted to make sure that everybody who hasn't spoken had an opportunity to do so first before I loop back to you. Thank or, you, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just as I, as I was referenced earlier, just real quickly in, in Regent Sviggum's comments, with respect to others in the university, I, I think that I think that a conflict um, plan would make sense. From my take, if they were directly over decisions with respect to security, and I would, I would be disinclined to support those. Um, and you know, and as far as, as far as the fact that we have a policy to deal with conflicts, that doesn't answer the question whether we have handle it appropriately. Um, you know, in, in, in fact, when you look at you know, this panel, one member voted that it wasn't a, an adequate plan. Um, I think at this level, at the board level, we should be peerless. We should be without flaw. Um, and that, you know, the, uh, the fact that they found that there is no way to eliminate all perception of influence, that's their quote. That's the quote of that committee. I don't know why this board, in the interest of the university, would ever take on the perception of influence. And that's their finding. I think that they're correct. You know, my general sense is that the presidency of an R1 institution is, is a big job. I would think that would be enough. Um, I also know that we have the business partnership and many other ways to interact with businesses in this community uh, to develop those relationships. And so um, I would just simply note, based on the information that we've been provided, we will be the first and only, to anyone's knowledge, Big Ten University that didn't have a conflict of this variety that has willingly accepted it after the employment of a chief executive. In every other case, there was either no contractual relationship or it existed when they hired the person and they, they did it knowingly. So um, that, that, that just uh, closes up my comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, anything further? Any further discussion on the matter? All right, then we will take a roll call vote. Uh, Jason, do you want to call the roll? On the motion to recommend approval of the conflict management plan as amended. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Farnsworth. No. Regent Farnsworth votes no. Regent Hipsch. Yes. Regent Hipsch votes yes. Regent Ruth Johnson. Yes. Regent Ruth Johnson votes yes. Regent Tad Johnson. Yes. Regent Tad Johnson votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. No. Regent Kenyanya votes no. Regent Powell. Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rosha. No. Regent Rosha votes no. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Regent Taliurabe. Yes. Regent Taliurabe votes yes. Regent Verhalen. Yes. Regent Verhalen votes yes. Chair Mayron. Yes. Chair Mayron votes yes. The motion passes with nine yeses and three noes. I believe that at this time that concludes, oh, we have information items. I'm sorry, I I got too excited. All right, Senior Vice President Myron Franz, would you like to address the uh, information items? I would, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, in, the, um, in your report, the information items include the Central Reserve's general contingency allocations, we have an annual report on the targeted business, community economic development, and small business programs, and we'll plan for a later time to talk more about those programs. We have the fiscal 2022 annual financial report for your review. We also have an investment advisory council update, and we have impact 2025 finance and operation implementation updates. I just want to point out three plans. There's the enterprise risk management plan in there. There's the university safety plan, and there's a climate action plan. So there's a lot of really great reading and I highly recommend that to you and your time. And uh, I have nothing further, Madam Chair. All right, thank you very much, Senior Vice President Franz. Any questions or discussion? 
Regent Farnsworth. Thanks, Chair Mayor. And I'm just saying this really quick for the record because I think it uh, matters and it gets noticed, you know, when we're talking about um, safety and security here and looking forward to that conversation tomorrow that I would love some conversation offline about what exactly is the MPAC 2025 safety plan. Uh, maybe I was supposed to know about that before and, and uh, didn't realize it, but some more clarity about what that is in the context of the MSAFE committee and everything else we're doing, that kind of popped out and seemed new. So I would love to have a conversation with somebody about that offline. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions or discussion? There being no additional business before the committee, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone. What's that? Sorry,